of that uh, very successful conference where we, among other things, we pointed out the important role of government uh, in the fourth, re in the fourth Industrial Revolution. We need, we, we were, we at PIDS, uh, we were pointing out that uh, like a, borrowing from an analogy of the, the World Bank, government needs to be a good gardener, preparing the ground, uh, in other words, building human resources, fertilizing the soil, boosting R&D, watering the plants, providing uh, the uh, financial support for innovation, and as well as weeding, as, as, uh, weeding uh, re removing weeds and pests. In other words, removing regulations, uh, competitive obstacles to innovation. Uh, during the September conference, Mr. Winston De De Marillo, one of the one of our speakers, pointed out that where we think we lack and where we can improve upon is in the area of creating an ecosystem for sustainable success. Not only do we need to increase the velocity of sharing our best practices, we also need regulations that can help, not just in funding our entrepreneurs, but also enabling connectivity between small entrepreneurs and large businesses. So we're living in a, in a VUCA world, uh, which has a lot of volatilities, uncertainties, complexity, and ambiguity. And this afternoon, we have, uh, we have a set of presenters from the regulatory side, uh, and we will be asking them essentially, what, what, do you, what are the, what, I mean, especially as a reaction to our, curl, our earlier session this morning, uh, a number of guide questions. Uh, can we show the guide questions? Uh, bottom line seems to be, are, are regulators doing their jobs well enough to harness the innovation ecosystem? And uh, we would like to also ask, what are your, the constraints they face? Um, so a number of specific questions would be, what are your specific regulatory objectives and perhaps even to follow through what Dr. Ortiz earlier mentioned, for whose benefit? What challenges do you face in performing your regulatory functions in the light of new technologies, the emerging technologies as a fourth industrial revolution? How do you think the industry will evolve as new products and business models are introduced? What are your strategies or approaches to cope with the demands of a complex and fast-changing environment, a VUCA world fueled by the fire. And what changes are needed, whether in the law, regulatory frameworks, or even institutions, um, to help encourage innovation while at the same time ensure that the overall regul regulatory objectives are being met. So may we now uh, we have a uh, uh, 44 set of presenter presentations from um, differing regula regulators. Uh, we may I first call on uh, the managing director of the policy and specialized supervision subsector of the BSP, Ms. Lynn Javier, who has uh, represented the BSP in various uh, international uh, um, groups, like the Basel Consulting Group, who, and she has, uh, she, she has been uh, a CPA by, uh, an account, accountant uh, by profession. She graduated from UP and uh, took her MBA at Ateneo. Um, Ms. Avier? Thank you. So good afternoon, and thank you very much for uh, inviting us to be part of this very relevant um, 
program. Um, the BSP welcomes opportunities to share our approach in terms of fintech financial technology or FIRE, the fourth industrial revolution. So my talk for today, I will cover the areas as shown on this slide, primarily focusing on the BSP's approach and initiatives to, um, as we also face the challenges and opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. So the accelerating pace of development in the financial industry, it's changing business processes, business models, and even changing the expectations of consumers. This is a significant impact on the strategic direction of our regulated uh, financial institutions. Um, the, the, the convenience being brought to our doorstep by FinTech, it's actually um, K, um, producing bespoke uh, products and financial services, fit for purpose financial products for our consumers. At the forefront of this transfer, uh, transformation is the fintech. Cognizant of this significant development in the financial industry, the IMF um, introduced in the Bali um, annual meetings um, the Bali fintech agenda. The IMF puts, puts forward 12 key principles to guide countries in optimizing the, the, the benefits of fintech, as well as being sensitive to its attendant risk. Similarly, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision um, grouped the product and services offered by fintech into three uh, core products being offered by the financial industry, credit, deposit taking, capital raising activities, payment clearing and settlement, as well as investment management services. The ma market support services, although not directly related to the core uh, services being offered by the banking industry, are also very important because they play a significant support role to the operations of our supervised financial institutions. So, um, the application of fintech in the financial industry cuts across uh, different transactions and services. But is, it is in the payment space where we've had significant um, growth and impact. This is actually very intuitive because it's, the payments uh, space open, is the gateway to other financial services such as credit, deposit taking, insurance, and investment management activities. So the, for fintech, or innovators, as we may call them, 33% comprise uh, uh, offer payment services, 30% alternative finance, such as crowdsourcing, and 16% are engaged in uh, blockchain technology or cryptocurrency, so, so the VCs um, uh, offering services in the remittance space. Let me skip this one, because in the banking industry, most of the uh, fintech-related services are in the internet banking and electronic money issuers. But we're looking at the next two years, the, the, the composition would actually change. So cognizant that the payments is a growth area in terms of digitizing uh, financial services, the BSP launched in December 2015 the National Retail Payment System, which is a policy and regulatory framework to promote that aims to establish a safe, reliable, and affordable retail payments. So we wanted to uh, make it possible that transfer from one bank to the other would not require you to visit a branch. So this is already working. We've already launched two automated clearing houses, the PesoNet and then the InstaPay. The national retail payment system is actually working on a coopetition principle. You cooperate in terms of making the system interoperable, but you compete in terms of the services and the fees you charge to our clients. So we have already a lot of banks involved in the PesoNet and InstaPay. You could transfer your uh, funds from one bank to the other without leaving your houses, so just using your mobile phone. So this is uh, one of the significant growth area in the payment space. The BSP also conducted a banking sector outlook survey in the first semester of 2018. And what the chief executive officers of banks disclose is that for universal commercial banks and the smaller banks, thrift and rural banks, they are both eyeing to grow the business in the next two years, as well as optimize the use of technology. In both cases, for growing the business, they want to tap or reach new markets. In using, uh, optimizing the use of technology, they would want to make their services and transactions more efficient. And based on the BSOS as well, 71% of the banks that we survey will use um, technology in their banking operations, more than 50% of their banking operations. 
But for the Banco Central, it's not just efficiency that's being offered by the fire. It's actually the transformational process in terms of reaching the unserved and underserved market. The BSP always endeavors to provide an enver environment that encourages financial in uh, innovation to promote financial uh, inclusion. So with the country's young population, the median age is at 24, and then uh, um, mobile usage of 21, uh, a high mobile usage, which was estimated to reach 71% in 2020, and high internet adoption, were primed to uh, leapfrog and provide better services in reaching more market through the use of digital technology. The BSP supports responsible fintech in innovation, not only because it provides greater efficiency, as I mentioned, but it has the potential to advance the BSP's cost for financial inclusion. So what are the overarching principles of B the BSP in terms of uh, promoting fintech and using, optimizing the use of technology, while at the same time being sensitive or uh, effective, uh, at the same time effectively manage the attendant risk. So we have three overarching principle. We have to issue risk-based and proportionate regulation. It has to be a multi-stakeholder collaboration. And we have to um, prioritize also consumer protection issues. What is risk-based and proportionate regulation? There's no one-size-fits-all in regulating the uh, players uh, in the industry. So we should not be imposing regulations that would only be applicable to institutions that pose significant risk exposures to the industry. So we have to scale our regulations in terms of the risk, the size, the risk profile, or systemic issues um, arising from a particular product or uh, solution. Active multi-stakeholder collaboration, because there are a lot of players multiple layers of uh, people involved in this um, development, as well as several regulators looking at the same, um, same entity or same product, we have to strengthen our collaboration in terms of adopting the same standards and uh, being able to understand in the same manner, in the same level, the risk attendant to a certain product or um, innovation. The third one is for consumer protection. Innovations at the end of the day must be beneficial to consumers, especially the most vulnerable ones. And those availing of the financial services for the first time should also be able to understand the, the, the services that they are using. Following these principles, we've actually adopted a test and learn approach. We called it test and learn approach in, back in 2004 when the e first e-money was introduced, the, the GCAS and the, sh the smart money. So in 2004, it's, it's called the test and learn approach, but now it's more popularly known as the regulatory sandbox. So what did we do? We let the, the player um, introduce the product in a controlled environment for us to better understand the risk. It was only in 2009, that's five years after, when we issued regulations on e-money, having a better understanding of the product and the risks they pose to the consumers and to the industry. So um, this is also, we, we are still adopting this uh, methodology. So most of the banks introducing new products or new players who wanted to um, enter the remittance business or the money transfer businesses and they are using um, a, a technology and technology enabled platform we allow them to operate in a controlled environment for us to better understand how it works and for us also to observe whether they will be able to manage the risk in, in using such products or services so what are the BSP's regulatory st strategies we practice as I've mentioned we practice the principle adoption of the principle of proportionality in our supervision. We have to be very flexible in understanding how a certain product operates. Also, um, with the advent of FinTech, there are several non-bank players. The question is, are we supposed to apply the regulations we have for banks to this not small players in the market? So those are the questions that we ask when we draft the policies involving FinTech or um, technology-related regulations. Uh, the, the bottom line is we have to understand the risk and the, the, the regulations, they have to be commensurate with the risk posed by the product or the entity. 
Second, we monitor the impact to banks and financial institutions. We assess whether banks can manage the attendant risk to using uh, 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 technology-enabled platforms or having their partnerships with other non-bank entities. We also have to be cognizant that there are non-bank players. So we're shifting our regulation to an activity-based approach. What does this mean? Before, when you identify a bank, you automatically say that this bank is under the supervision of the BSP. What does an activity-based supervision mean? When a certain entity um, engages in activities that should be within the regulatory perimeter of the BSP or supervision, sorry, ambit of the BSP, that entity would have to fall under the supervision of the BSP. An example would be those entities involved in the, involved in the money transfer business. Or when an entity is involved in um, getting credit, and then re-lending it, that would be called quasi-banking without actually being tagged or identified as a quasi-bank. So that is an activity-based uh, approach to supervision. The third is we, we re the third one, which I, was, so I already explained. We recognize and monitor the partici participation of non-banks, and finally, we coordinate and cooperate with other regulators. We have an interagency forum, the Financial Sector Forum, and the Financial Sector Forum actually created a committee, a fintech committee, looking at all the innovations in the market and identifying the policy gaps. This would allow us to harmonize our expectations and standards that would apply to entities that would fall um, uh, across that would fall under the supervision across different uh, uh, supervisory agency. Now, how did we re how did we prepare the regulatory environment for a fintech or for fire? So basically, our regulations are, could generally be grouped into two, four categories. The first one, regulations that aim to promote accountability and responsibility. And this one, we introduced to the issue ones of corporate governance guidelines, setting out the responsibilities of the board, senior management, the first, second, and third lines of defense in the organization. The second one, regulations have, we set, uh, issued regulations that set out expectations in terms of managing risk. Now, these regulations cover the operational risk management expectations, technology risk management, information security risk management, social media risk management, and we have also set out specific control expectations, such as the multi-factor authentication. The third set of regulations aimed at promoting the sustained resiliency of the financial system. So this one, we have the DCIB framework. So the big banks involved in this high-tech um, technology-enabled platforms are required to put, on, uh, to put up additional capital as a domestic systemically important institution. We also require them to submit a recovery plan and business continuity plan to ensure that any identified, unidentified threats or emerging risks, they would be able to sustain the, the, the stress coming out of it. And then finally, the non-bank players, the VC, we have set out a regulatory framework for them so that they would fall under the, the BSP supervision. The fourth set of regulations, we aim to leverage on technology to democratize access to financial services and accounts. So uh, examples of this would be the third-party cash agents, and we also allowed eKYC, wherein you could already open an account, a deposit account, just by using your mobile phone without even going to the banks. Th those flexibility, those measures that we've allowed is commensurate to the risk that you pose to the entity. Of course, if you're a high-risk client, the, the bank would ask you to visit their branch to, to have a full-blown KYC. But if you're a retail, low-risk client, you could do it by use, just using your mobile phone. Internally, we're also using FinTech to improve our processes and supervisory methodologies. In fact, we have two projects um, currently, there are two projects currently running in the BSP right now. The first one is the use of an API for the reporting system. We're in phase 1.5, where it's a, just a machine to machine talking to allow us to better analyze and generate statistics and reports to improve our supervisory, our surveillance and supervisory uh, methodology. The second one is the use of chatbots in responding to consumer complaints and issues. So you could text, email, or via Facebook Messenger, you could uh, send your complaints, and uh, via chatbot, we will respond to these complaints that you sent. 
parallel to this, the BSP has other ongoing initiatives relating to uh, fintech activities. Uh, we continuously monitor fintech activities and we're looking actually at look, um, using blockchain methodology in um, assessing the, the, the cybers, cyber risk resilience of some financial institutions. Second, we created a subsector de dedicated to fintech uh, financial technology. We have a fintech lab under one department wherein uh, fin um, non-bank players or financial institutions could introduce new products. And we are also having domestic and international collaboration. Fintech and the cyber uh, risk or issues that they pose uh, largely depends on the sharing of information and understanding of the risk patterns. So we do have um, a um, memorandum of agreement with the Monetary Authority of Singapore to share expertise, knowledge, as well as to endorse new fintech players that we think uh, could uh, actually help in improving the uh, business, the, the, the transactions in the industry. So um, what are the key takeaways in, in this presentation? As regulators, we, we have to accept that the fourth industrial re revolution is upon us. The second one is we have to adopt proportionate regulation to ensure that uh, beneficial innovation flourishes. And we have to ensure that there, there is level playing field. The small market players cannot compete with the big banks in the industry. So we have to be very, very sensitive uh, and conscious that our regulations are risk-based. And the third one, we have to create an enabling environment, a forward-looking environment to ensure that we will not curtail innovation. We have to signal the openness of the regulators to this development. So um, that's my presentation for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn, for not only for your uh, very good presentation that sort of suggests why Dr. Ortiz was very positive about the BSP. No, he mentioned earlier that um, he, he, uh, he, he, Dr. Ortiz was saying that the, the that regulators need to get out of the pres their prescriptive modes. Uh, of um, regulatory frameworks to progressive ones that con that uh, look into adaptive, uh, uh, risk-based, uh, collaborative, uh, outcome-based regulatory frameworks. And so we need, we, we've heard from uh, Ms. Javier that uh, what exactly BSB has been doing to exactly fit into that role of a very good regulator. Um, of course, it doesn't mean we're a perfect regulator, nobody is, um, but uh, we're, we're fortunate enough that we, we have quite a number of our regulators around to, that possibly can learn from the experiences of BSP on how, they, how to best uh, you know, work out with their, with their industries, uh, um, issues and concerns. Uh, doing all this test and learn and the uh, sandbox approaches, regulatory sandbox uh, approaches of uh, that that sort of ultimately will be able to um, identify the the welfare, uh, the, well address the welfare of of uh, consumers. Uh, our uh, we our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, the, the no less than the chairman of. Uh, the Land Transportation and Franchising Regul Regulatory Board, the LTFRB. Um, he has uh, had uh, uh, practically three decades of law practice and litigation work. Um, though he, this is his first stint in, in the government service. Um, he ha ha finished his Bachelor of Laws from the Ateneo de Davao University in 1987, uh, and a year later was admitted to the bar. Uh, may we now call on Attorney Mal M Martin Delgra? Good afternoon, everyone. As, as mentioned, 
this is my first time in government. I have been quietly working in Davao City, but uh, <clears throat> when the mayor, we still call him mayor, uh, won, he needs uh, all the help that he can get. So I'm here in government, and it just so happened that uh, it's one position I realized too soon that I cannot avoid uh, talking to media. <laughs> That's the last people that I would be able to talk to. Anyway, <clears throat> it's quite a challenge. No? Uh, you mentioned about uh, the fourth industrial revolution. And when I saw the invitation, I kind of realized that uh, we are not yet there yet, in so far as LTFRB is concerned. Can you imagine? If any one of you who are familiar with computer programs, we, we still run our database program on FoxPro. So uh, that's how far back we are. But uh, it's really not about technology in so far as we're concerned, but we're getting there. It's about passion. And it's about having to address the principal need, uh, the need of our principal stakeholder. A lot of people are thinking that our principal stakeholder would be the uh, commuter, uh, the uh, <clears throat> transport operators. May they be buses, UV, taxi, but they're not. Our principal stakeholders, ang mananakay. Yan ang hugot namin. Mananakay, wala pong iba. Whether, it be, whether they be TNVS, bus, taxi, UV, whatever, it's always at the bottom. Uh, the bottom line here is about the mananakay. But obviously, the state or public transportation system is something much to be desired to, what, to where we're going right now. And we're happy that we have put in place a modernization program that does not only speak about having to change the unit, because that has always been uh, <clears throat> the so-called modernization policy of uh, the LTFRB before simply about changing the old units into new ones. But that's not the case. When you run a public transportation system, you run a system, not simply deploying units on the road. So we stand in the midst of a revolution that is altering the way we live, we work, and we communicate. And if I may say, we move. It is our mantra in DOTR and LTFRB that we move people, not cars. So when we address public transportation needs, we also address, among others, especially in Metro Manila, traffic congestion. And that's the reason why a lot of people are getting private vehicles, because they cannot rely on the inefficient public transportation that we have. So we welcome the change with eagerness. Uh, obviously, as I've said, the lack of, uh, the lack of uh, technology that we have at the moment, dexterity would be the call of the day in order to adopt, innovate, and modernize, no? and improve the quality of life for our people. As the mayor would say, it is about addressing the uh, comfortable commuting experience of our mananakay. And having said that, it's about having to address governance no? and the relevance of the regulatory framework that we have put in place. So the ability of government to continuously adopt and keep up with very competitive and rapidly changing technological advances will determine its relevance and survival. The regulatory body is obviously uh, to embrace the change, and it's about passion as well. As you can see, perhaps there is not a week or a month na walang piquet sa LTFRB. So we still, have to, we still have a lot of work to do in having to convince a lot of people and uh, that's why I, I welcome the invitation that you've given us precisely to spread the good news about the modernization program. So what do we have? That is what we have right now. EDSA being a big parking space. And when people ask me what is the state or our public transportation system, I would always say Exhibit A, EDSA whether either you have too many buses waiting for fewer passengers, and that makes EDSA their temporary terminal, or you have fewer buses uh, on the road with so many uh, passengers waiting on the side. Kahit papaano kung may pila sa bus, lalo na sa mga pasahero, masakit ang mata 
na makikita namin at sasakit yung loob mo namin pag mangyayari yan. But that is the state or public transportation system. And to say not the least, it is unsafe, unhealthy, unreliable, and com uncomfortable. No? Uh, <clears throat> the boundary system is the heart of the inefficiency of our public transportation system. We need to run our public transportation system the way it should be. A system that, as of what we're pushing now, based on technology. It is also, as I've said, for a long, long time, there is no effective government planning on a road network. When we talk about having to run a route or having to plan a public transportation system, it's a system not only having to look at uh, technology as something that we can use to advance the system, but also having to look at interconnectivity. And interconnectivity in relation to routes, because you actually our travel patterns are not one directional from origin to destination. You end up somewhere and take another route. You end up somewhere and you end up you take another mode, meaning it's not only about interconnectivity of routes, but interconnectivity of modes from buses to taxi, probably to another PUJ or to an TNVS, no? or it probably if it happens. Another motorcycle taxi. That is what you're, that is the discussion of the day now. No? So, and it is operator initiated. Kaya nga wala masadong pagpaplano. When I came in, I came to realize that yung pagkukuha o pagbibigay ng prangkisa po is mostly 95 percent, no? Operator initiated. Ang ibig sabihin niyan, pag may isang negosyante, extra money to run a, to, to run a route, would go to LFRB, get a franchise. No? But basically, ganon. Ang gobyerno hindi niya hawak yung responsibilidad to really look at the problem, to look at the issue on any particular scenario, whether it be Metro Manila or whether it be Tacloban or whether it be Gerald Santos, and to see the need in relation, uh, in, in so far as public transportation needs of the, of the uh, residents is concerned. Wala pong ganong seryosong pagpaplano when we came in. At saka, siyempre, yung route measured capacity, in, if, I may, if I may say, this, that has been the easy excuse of corruption when you have that. No? So it's, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, Route-based, not network-based ang pagpaplano. Kasi nga, operator initiated. The operator does not care about the other routes. He would only care about the route that he's applying for. That's the bottom line there. No? Now, <clears throat> so what has happened is that there is widespread competition among various transport modes. Naglalabanan. And if I may say, when I say naglalabanan, nagpapatayan pa sa daan. Nagsusuntukan yung mga driver. Ganun po yun ang nangyayari. So, you know, so uh, widespread competition, overlapping of routes, you have low capacity vehicle, running a high volume route. Now, can you imagine jeepneys? So basically, when, like for example, Metro Manila, all of us can relate about traffic congestion. So if, uh, if it's a high volume route, this is just... A, a rule of thumb in so far as transport planning is concerned. If it's a high volume route where the road capacity or the road network can accommodate a bus, it should be a bus that runs there so that you will have fewer buses rather than many more jeepneys that you're going to put in place. It's a very, it's, it's a very basic logic in having to address it. But obviously, the, getting there takes a lot of study. Huh? So what is the government doing right now? Huh? Uh, LTFRB's mission, vision, has always been there from the start. Now, way, way back, when this was created in 1987, uh, 89, no? but uh, we have not been getting there in terms of modernizing our public transportation. Kaya ngayon, yung core program po namin is the PUVMP, the Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program. We breathe. This, uh, this is now the core program. Almost everything that we do in uh, LTFRB is about this. No? Um, <clears throat> the POV modernization program has been the heart no, of the policy in so far as modernizing our public transportation needs. No? So how do we look at it? We look at it, as I've said, we move people, not cars. No? 
It's people first, so far as the one's concerned. So the objective is, uh, there are three components. I'm already, uh, I still am not halfway through, but I'll just make this quick. The objective is, is about having to address the social dimension. Alam natin na marami nagreklamo, lalo na sa mga driver operator. Na? But we need to be inclusive in this one. Inclusive in a sense that they will not, we will not leave them behind. That's why we have, uh, we need to address that as well. Environmental because, uh, ang nangyayari po, um, alam natin, mausok, mabulok yung mga current fleet natin. So there is also a component of having to modernize our fleet. And obviously, the economies, uh, the economies of, uh, the economics or the financial component as well, no? We need to keep the uh, public transportation services viable so that we'll be able to meet the public need of our commuters. There are uh, 10 major components, and I will just have to uh, concentrate on four. Uh, one is the regulatory reform, which includes the consolidation of franchise. What that actually means is that yung boundary system at saka pa isa-isa ng mga unit under a franchise is really very inefficient. There is on-street competition day in and day out, and we're not, they're competing with each other. Practically, they're not addressing the need of our commuters. No? And the other one is about, as I said earlier, fleet um, modernization. So we need to have either electric jeep or uh, uh, Euro 4 compliant vehicles. And it has to meet uh, the technical uh, standards uh, in so far, uh, technical and uh, environmental standards. No? Uh, also, we need to address fleet management. So, ito yung po yung heart ng ating tinatawag na efficient uh, public transportation system. It is the predictability. If you would notice MRT coming in at two minutes or three minutes because that is the headway of each coach or train, that should be the case on the ground. That should be the case on the road. May pasahero wala, tatakbo yan. So it's about having to address our needs, not the, need, not the needs of our transport uh, group. Malaki po ito. Um, uh, there are other components as well, no? the vehicle use for life. Uh, ibig sabihin po, uh, papaano yung scrappage program, nagtatanggal tayo ng mga luma at bulok, where, we'll, where are we going to put them? No? So those things, we're addressing it. Malaki po ito, this is the, if I may say, the biggest, perhaps the biggest non-infra project of the Duterte administration. No? And it takes a lot of partners to do that together. No, hindi lang po LTFRB, hindi lang po DOTR, lahat po nagtumutulong. Kasama na po yung academe, kasama na po yung mga international development partners natin. So uh, there is no single individual or entity who can claim uh, credit to all this. Talagang uh, mabusisi at ang daming tumutulong hanggang ngayon po. No? Uh, our launch was in Tacloban. No? What happened in Tacloban is basically what we want to see, and you're actually seeing it right now. In fact, I just came from the launch of Isakai with uh, Mani Pangilinan uh, in attendance. Uh, it's a subsidiary of Miralco. Uh, they run, they have opened up a Isakai route from uh, Makati to Mandaluyong using e-vehicles. The vehicles are actually tested by the uh, by the Miralco engineers para sigurado na Ito talaga is up to the standards of the of Meralco because uh, they will run it on electric. You know? So also in Tacloban, ganun din po. You know? So what I'm saying is that, uh, just very quickly lang, yung ginawa po namin sa Tacloban, it's consolidation of franchise. Ang ibig po sabihin niyan, isang, prang, isang prangkisa, isang operator tatakbo ng isang rota. Hindi po mag-away-away yung, yung mga operator. So when that happens, you simply have to run it. We already have studied the volume. We already have studied the distance. We already have studied the fare. Multiply all those, you already would be assured of the financial viability. Ganun lang po kasimple. Pero as I've said, getting there is a little bit complicated. So that said, wag mo nang isipin kung lean hours or peak hours yan. Tatakbuhin mo lang yan. And we're not... We're not uh, we're, we have veered away from the uh, boundary system already. No? Ibig sabihin po, wala na po tayo yung umaasa tayo sa lakas ng katawan ng driver. So, nangyayari, salary-based na po ito. So, uh, wh so what happened was, it, they would be able to extend their service. 
from 8 hours, 10 hours, or 12 hours, kung depende sa katawan ng isang driver na, na, na nagbaboundary, tumatakbo, uh, tumatakbo ng dalawang shifts. So, umaabot ng mga 16, 18 hours a day. So, again, addressing the concern of the commuters. Ano po? The gig is also one uh, good news to us. In fact, we have proven right in so far as the gig is concerned. Because uh, on the first delivery of the first unit po, alam mo ang nangyayari? Uh, they have these are existing operators, individual operators. They consolidated under one co-op. They run the routes, 171 units, but they started modernizing it on their first 10 units. No? They already have set aside their monthly amortization to uh, sa banko, uh, paid their gasoline, uh, paid their uh, drivers and all the operating costs. On their first uh, three months, nag -na net income sila ng 1 million on the first 10 units. They still have about 170 units to go. They add up uh, recently another 20. I don't know what the numbers are for them right now. So, uh, Notwithstanding what the other transport group are saying, tuloy-tuloy po ito. Umaarangkada po yung POVMP. So on the technical requirement, just to give you a glimpse on technology side, no? we're looking at having to make our transportation system safe and convenient. No? So ibig sabihin, may CCTV, may dashcam, may GPS. Yung GPS is about having to determine both. It will, give, it will support the operator in their fleet management system, they will be able to monitor their fleet no? from, uh, from preventive maintenance to deployment to, uh, to uh, having to end their shift. No? And also, on, our, uh, on their part, they would be able to determine fare because they are now using what you call the AFCS, Automatic Fare Collection System. I can say this with... Uh, uh, this is the first time in the history of the PUJ na papas pa sasakay kayo ng PUJ po, gagamit kayo ng card, hindi kayo gagamit ng pera. Ano? So, yun po ang ginagawa natin ngayon sa Tacloban, ganun po ang nangyayari. In, in some parts that we have launched in Metro Manila, ganun din po ang nangyayari. Ganun po ang nangyayari sa Cagayan de Oro, Cebu, and uh, General Santos. So, those are, the, those are the features of a modern PUJ. But nevertheless, when you talk about regulation, we also have to understand that there are a lot of things that we need to address. Kasi po, we came uh, from an environment na talagang maraming problema when we came in. No? Anti-colorum for that matter is a problem. The colorum activity is, a, is really a problem. No? Uh, not much to, to talk about in so far as uh, colorum is concerned. Even if we have increased by 1,000%, 1, no? if you look at the numbers, 0.6%, uh, in the last five and a half years before we came in, and the last two and a half years we came in, it's about almost six units per day on the average. But nevertheless, uh, we still have a lot to go to. But colorum exists because of either the lack of public transport or an inefficient public transport system. And that's the reason why we breathe uh, PUVMP. Now, uh, we know that technology is catching up with regulation. And in fact, it has run too fast than regulation. And this is the case of Uber and Grab. So, kaya I'm going to mention a little bit about uh, uh, that. No? Na alam nyo na yung nangyari sa Grab and Uber before, na talagang marami silang inacredit, na hindi naman sila dumaan sa LTFRB for their franchise. Eh, umaangal yung iba tinitira natin. No? Yung mga PUV, uh, buses, UV, taxi. Tumitira kayo ng mga ano, for anti-color mo, hindi naman yung tinitira yung Grab and Uber. We did. And we had a big catch. No? Uh, close to uh, three dozen cars of Uber and Grab. And only to find out that they were actually accrediting. Ito, ito, wholesale color room in the tens of thousands that they have accredited to run on the road. Because anything... Any vehicle that stands on the road that picks up passenger for a fee is a public utility vehicle and for which you need to get authority from LTFRB. Ganun po yung basic ano lang, rule on the matter. So we need to address it, but nevertheless, we were able to address it as well. So now, maayos na po tayo, naglalagay na tayo ng mga units uh, ng mga TNBS. And we also have spread the market for the TNC, yung mga transport network uh, corporations, na gustong lumahok. No? 
by the use of that technology, the ease of bridging or connecting the driver with the passenger using the apps. And because of that technology as well, we also have required existing taxi operators no, to have this technology as well. No? So uh, uh, those are the things that uh, we're doing right now. No? So as I've said, we still have a lot to do in so far as regulation is concerned. So uh, perhaps I will just take the other matters. My time is up. I'll take up the other matters during the open forum. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Well, uh, we, we heard it straight from one of the uh, regulators that seems to be uh, always uh, on the media, <laughs> uh, maybe, to, maybe, for, maybe to some extent because of the different the, the, the binding constraints that they have. Um, we will now be moving forward to uh, the, uh, the health sector. And we may, for this, we will be calling on um, the officer in charge of the policy and planning service of the Food and Dr Drug Administration, who is a graduate of uh, BS uh, Electronics and Communications Engineering from Mapua Institute of Technology, and who holds also an MA in Public Administration from UP. Um, she has had a, about 30 years of, uh, of, of service uh, at the D DOH. Uh, and currently is the division's chief of the licensing and uh, registration division uh, of the uh, FDA, uh, Miss uh, the engineer Maria Cecilia Patienzo. Magandang magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Good afternoon. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Albert. And uh, on behalf of our Director General, I would like to thank um, PIDS for inviting the Food and Drug Administration to this event. Um, when I was tasked to present a few days ago, sabi ko, ano kaya pe-present ko rito? I don't know what type of presentation I should uh, prepare. No? without knowing sino ba yung audience. So uh, I think I will just present um, FDA, the new FDA, compared to the FDA you have known before. I'll be presenting uh, what innovations that we have been doing and the way forward uh, so that uh, siguro makakup up tayo with this uh, industrial revolution. So to start with, I'll just have, be having um, three topics. I would like to reintroduce FDA, and I would like to uh, discuss on our regulatory framework based on law, and uh, way forward. San ba kami pupunta? May pagbabago ba sa loob ng FDA? Marami ko bang may kilala sa FDA dito? I, I, I would just like to level off on the audience. Marami ho ba kaming stakeholders dito? Para ready ho ako pag nagtanong kayo. <laughs> wala na yung, wala na taga M Clinica. Parang kinakabahan ako, no? Ah, andiyan pa yung taga M Clinica. At least may ka-partner pa akong konti. <laughs> yeah, okay. Tapos magle-lecture ako parang nakakaantok. So I, 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 I will just make this uh, presentation somewhat exciting and uh, a little bit short. <laughs> So to start with, uh, this is just the legal basis of FDA. So we started in 1963 with the approval of uh, Republic Act 3720. And then uh, in 1982, we have uh, uh, amendment no? based on EO um, 851. With these two law, the structure of FDA was uh, more on a service base. 
no? Regulation, licensing. Halo-halo. So, one unit is just uh, giving license to all the product uh, establishment that are covered by FDA. Food, drug, cosmetics. And then, one section is just doing product registration. So, uh, hindi ganan ka effective yung scheme. So, in 2009, Republic Act 9711 was approved. And this is called the FDA Strengthening Act. No? Ano yung pagbabago during this uh, new act? No? Sa saan yung focus natin? So, this is the current organogram of FDA. Uh, in government, it's really very hard to build up if, uh, the new manpower complement, even if you have an existing law. Um, the difference from the previous organization is that this is now product-based. Yung paghahati-hati ng FDA is product-based. So, mas alam mo, from, from your establishment to the product, isang unit lang ang nagahandle. Okay? And then we have now our own regional offices. We control our own regional offices. Unlike before, the regional offices of FDA was administratively under the Department of Health and technically under the FDA. So, di ba mahirap pagka dalawang boss? Sino susundin mo? Utusan ka namin mag-grade because you are under our technical supervision. Sasabihin naman ng ano, wala kayong budget. Kasi administratively, under kayo ng DOH. So, wala tayong available budget. So, ngayon, mas maganda yung kilos natin because administratively and technically, under the supervision of the FDA. However, we were not yet able to create all our regional offices. So, sabi sa amin ng DBM, lima muna. So, we need to cluster. So, we now have five cluster looking into our regional operations. So, this is our four big centers. Uh, this is the one that was created because of Republic Act 9711. So, we have the Center for Food, the Center for Cosmetics, the Center for Drug, and the Center for Device Regulation. So, ngayon, we have our own uh, distinct product jurisdiction. Now, for the Center for Cosmetics, ito ho yung lahat naming pampa. Pampaganda, pampatay, di ba? Because they cover cosmetic products, they even cover uh, toys, they cover household pesticides, and now they will be covering tobacco control and e-cigarette. So uh, the bill, uh, I think, was already passed in the House for the e-cigarette, and it will now be endorsed to the Senate. Then we have the Center for Drug Regulation and Research. Alam ko ito yung pinaka popular sa FDA. They're covering um, drug products, both for human and veterinary products. They have uh, medical oxygen, traditional medicine, vaccines, and biologicals. Then we have the Center for Food. Simple lang ang food. Processed food. If it is not processed, if the meat is not processed, sa DA po yan. Pag sinabi nating process, meron ka nang ginawa. Tinimplahan mo ng asin, minarinate mo, binenta mo, it's already under the FDA. Then, we control the raw materials for food. And we also have food supplements. Ito yung mga ang dami-daming commercial na nakalagay, no therapeutic claims. Pero ang commercial nila, nakagagaling. Di ba? No therapeutic claim. Pero gumaling yung tuhod ko, gumaling yung rayuma ko. But it's still a food supplement, no? It's a matter of semantics lang daw. Kasi mas, alam nila mas mahirap i-register ire as drugs. Mas madali siyang i-register as food, no? Sa food, mas mabilis. Sa drugs, matagal. Wala man taga drugs dito. <laughs> so now, the new player is the Center for Device. The medical device was previously under the Center for Drugs, no? But now we, ha um, the Center for Device, have their own um, uh, was created separately from device, and it covers not only medical devices, 
We cover radiation devices. We cover health-related devices, in vitro diagnostic products. And meron lang ho kaming isang medyo naligaw because uh, with the creation of 9711, the whole Bureau of Health Devices and Technology, who's covering radiation facility, was transferred to the Food and Drug Administration. Kaya ho meron kaming regulation of radiation facilities. No? Ito po yung mga x-ray machines natin. Huh? Not only for medical applications, but for non-medical, yung sa mga ports and airports. Okay? So this is the uh, regulatory framework of uh, the Food and Drug Administration. Tatlo lang po. Licensing and inspection, registration of the product, and then enforcement or post-market surveillance. Okay. For the licensing of establishment, when we say establishment, we are regulating the manufacturers of all these products, no? uh, the traders. Ang kaibahan lang ho ng uh, definition ng trader uh, based on Republic Act 9711 is, hindi ho ito yung regular concept natin na nagtitrade. So traders in the context of 9711 are those uh, who are the owners of the product. Ikaw ang formulators. So they call them traders. Then we have the distributors, we have importers, exporters, wholesalers, and the uh, retailers, drugstores. Meron din ho kaming nire-regulate ng mga operators. Ito yung sa household uh, pesticides kasi uh, inilipat ito from the former, uh, I think the fertilizer administration. Okay? Ito ho yung mga bagong nalipat sa amin. Then we register drug, food, food supplements, medical devices, household urban pesticides. So, ang pathway nun are all reg registration. And then, meron ho kaming mas mabilis, which is notification for cosmetics. Kasi ho, yan ho yung uh, uh, understanding for the ASEAN eh. And then, uh, we have the toys and child care articles, notification din ho. The notification, ito yung mga low-risk products. Then, we are doing post-market uh, surveillance. When we say post-market, before, the focus of FDA is just to register and to license. Register and license. So, kung ang napepenalize lang natin are all um, establishments or products na nagko-comply sa regulation ng FDA. Hindi ho natin nakikita yung mga violators. So, now we intensify our post-market uh, surveillance. So, when doing the post-market surveillance, pati yung mga ads and promo uh, tinitingnan natin. And then, we look into the market. Kasi minsan, nagre-register sila, ginagamit yung product registration number mo, dinidikit sa ibang produkto. So, ganun ho, nahuhuli natin yan. Plus, all those uh, establishment na walang license to operate. So, eto ho yung aming mga barriers and challenges. Simple lang. Manpower complement as compared to our uh, uh, mandated functions. We have a very outdated system. So thanks to M-Clinica, pero kaming medyo bago, no? And then, uh, the bureaucratic process. Kanina ho, na-discuss natin about COA. I think sila na lang atang hindi nagbabago so that we could move forward. <laughs> and then we have uh, fast technology change. Nagsisimula pa lang kaming mag-bidding pag in luma na yung technology sa sobrang tagal ng proseso. And then, never-ending new products. Diba? Walang, walang katapusan. Especially for sa, sa, um, sa machine side, ano? ang dami. New, new uh, technology, even the food supplements, iba't ibang klaseng food supplements na kagagaling para sa lahat. And then, of course, our demands of the consumer and the stakeholders. So pag lahat ng yan, nasa inyo, parang ang hirap kumilos, no? But we are very glad that we have a millennial director general. Sabi nga namin, parang magkaiba na yung uh, ano natin, no? Kagaya kanina yung usapan doon. Why is it us taking too long no, to change? Kasi nga yung iba, ang lakas ng resistance to change. Pero ngayon, May batang pumasok, parang may ba kamay na bakal. 
And she tied up with PNP so that we could do our enforcement activities. So medyo marami ho tayong nahuhuli. So for the start, she gave us a three marching orders. 72 hours turnaround time. Ano-ano yung mga transactions na pwedeng 72 hours? Ano-ano yung pwede naming i-commit? No? Kasi sabi nila lagi, mabaga lang FDA. So ito yung unang order. Next, zero backlog. Ang daming hindi lumalabas. So we na wipe out niya lahat ng backlog. And we are about 80% uh, no? dun sa ating mga backlog. And then ito yung strengthened enforcement partnering with PNP so that we could enforce our regulatory function. Kaya na namin hong ipasara kahit sikat pa sila. And then, of course, image. Pag nakita nyo yung opisina namin, parang it's not conducive to work. No? Medyo luma na, hindi pa namin nababago. So, simulan natin sa umpisa. Alin yung pinaka- uh, front gate natin. This is the FDA Action Center. And the, the, um, yung, yung ginawa namin is just to bring our services nearer to the people. So this is a pilot project wherein we are putting our um, frontliners sa mga malls. So this FDA Action Center is located at Star Mall in Alabang. Since we don't have a facility, no? Mahirap magpabili, uh, mahirap gumawa ng building. So, tingnan natin, pag hinintay natin ng bidding, paano pa tayo makakapag-innovate? E nag -off, may mga nag-offer naman ng mga um, uh, department stores, no? Uso na ngayon, katabi namin ng mga other government offices. So, we tried to go to the mall. So, this is initial uh, venture. I think we will improve our office in Ali Mall. We have one in Cubao. Then, of course, nabanggit ko kanina yung ease of doing business. And we are very serious to uh, follow this uh, law. We are doing our product repeal, uh, the repeal project wherein we are reviewing our laws or our policies, our guidelines. Baka marami nang outdated. Baka may kailangan na kaming baguhin. No? So, uh, malapit na ho naming matapos yan. We are looking into our citizen's charter. Uh, gaano ba kaigsi namin pwedeng paigsiin ang proseso? Baka naman may mga requirements na pwede na nating tanggalin. Baka naman nagdodobol. Hinanap na ito sa licensing. Hahanapin pa ba natin ito ulit sa registration? So we're reviewing into that. Mas makonting requirements, mas mabilis na proseso. And we have this... Uh, new thing, regulatory impact analysis. So this is uh, being done for our policies. Kailangan ba? Kailangan ba natin gawin tong policies na to? Ano yung magiging impact nito? Ano yung magiging benefit? So parang it's just a risk uh, analysis then, but it, they call it uh, regulatory impact analysis. So we have different for programs, no? We have the KKK program. Hindi ho kami mga katipunero. But this is uh, kaagapay sa kalusugan at kaligtasan. Uh, this is a um, partnership with the Department of Health. Kasi yung delivery of uh, the medicines, medyo mabagal. No? So what we are doing is to have a dedicated laboratory service for the testing of all these uh, drugs that are being procured by the Department of Health. So that uh, we could uh, shorten uh, the the processing time or the testing time, sila lang. We will put uh, manpower, we will put equipment, we will give them reagents, no? Focus, yung laboratory natin, so that mabilis yung delivery natin. So we are uh, curing the access, access to medicines, no? Nung ating mga pasyente. Then, eto ho yung ano, clamor ngayon, the MSMEs. But we are focusing ho muna with the micro. So this is a partnership with DTI, DOH, and FDA. So yung mga maliliit natin, yung mga backyard uh, businesses natin, specifically for food, na gustong, uh, gustong mag-register for uh, the FDA. So tulungan natin sila, gusto nila eh. No? So tulungan natin so that they will be able to produce safe products. And meron din, uh, mabigyan din natin sila ng kabuhayan. No? So uh, ilo-launch po natin tong micro na to. Nagkaroon na ho ng... Uh, 
memorandum of agreement and we will be uh, using the negotiation centers ng DTI. Mas mabilis sa proseso and ang pangako ho namin, kahit may license to operate ka muna, pwede ka na mag-produce. Kasi manufacturers ho sila eh. So they will follow GMP. Ngayon, medyo i-wave muna natin yan. May uh, inaayos yung mga proseso, yung mga requirements para at least uh, we will uh, ensure the safety of all these products ano, produced ng mga MSMEs so, or the micro. So with the new technology, ito ho yung pinakapangarap namin and hopefully, mabili na ho namin to. Sabi nga namin, sa ngayon, bumibili kami, nagbibuild. Hindi ho ganun kabilis para maramdaman ito. No? So we will be having a digital workplace. Um, yung information security namin, uh, medyo malimit kung nagkakaroon tayo ng problema. No? May mga hackers tayo. We will have a good software. Uh, big data analytics. We want to establish our database kasi the majority of the time was consumed by people asking, is this a registered product? No? We need to really build up our database para people could uh, access our database. They know if the product that they are using are uh, registered. No? At isa pa, ang isang pinakapangarap natin is really to make FDA a household name. Kahit sa mga bata. So may mga nagpupunta na ho sa aming mga grade school no? during the FDA. So we open our doors to the students. No? Para at least yung pagbibili sila ng food, titingnan nila, FDA approved, yung nutritional value. So meron din kami pang public health, may ilo-launch uh, kami regarding the front of label pack no? because of this chain law. Uh, Ang dami ho namin law. Basically, yung pinakita ko kanina are just three legal bases, pero marami, sobrang dami hong law na ini-implement ang FDA. And then, uh, we will be soon launching na yung uh, you could uh, track your applications, no? Kahit sa cellphone. Uh, medyo na-delay lang ho yung implementation natin, but this is uh, already in can. So, um, aside from all these uh, digital innovations, we are part having international alignments, no? Harmonization. If there are existing rules, we will not be reinventing the wheels. The reason why we are actively participating in the different uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN uh, harmonization efforts. No? And then, the most important thing, ito ho yung i-achieve namin this year, gusto natin pumosisyon ulit sa international uh, scene. Ito yung FDA accession plan, wherein we are applying for the ASEAN GMP. No? Pag, uh, this is particularly, particularly for drugs, yung mutual uh, recognition uh, arrangement. Pag naging... Uh, Pag naipasa po namin ito, madali na po namin maipasa yung PICS. And we are working with the WHO uh, Global uh, Benchmarking Tool. I think with all these things, we will be able to embrace no, the industrial revolutions that uh, we are facing right now. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Engineer Matienzo, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation on on what the FDA is today and what it has been. Um, now we move to one of the uh, uh, issues that many people have, uh, especially in the wake of a seeming leak in the passport uh, and uh, among other things. Uh, someone who uh, we're, we seem to be. Talk, getting into issues uh, that are concerns really of uh, the pu pu public concerns. So uh, we will be calling on uh, the uh, uh, commissioner and chairman of the National Privacy Commission, uh, who I think was used to be with government since 2010 when he was then uh, the director of the uh, Science and Technology Information Institute and eventually became the an assistant secretary of the DOST. Uh, he is, uh, he happens to be an alumnus of UP School of Economics, no? uh, by the way. Um, and uh, may, without further ado, may I, may I uh, call on uh, chairman of the National Privacy Commission, Raymond Libero.
Alright, nako na uh, nasabi ang kagad ako ng doktor ako oh, 20 minutes. Okay. Good afternoon. Opo, uh, bago ako magsimula, ilan ho ba na galing sa gobyerno dito? Taas ang kamay. Ha? Huh? dami nyo ah. Private. I mean for a for a for an event na do, maraming government agencies. Hindi tayo mga naka-onesimus. Alam niyo yung barong Tagalog? Onesimus. <laughs> Di ba? Yun yung ano eh. Di ba? Kasi so usually pag may government, naka barong Tagalog na Onesimus. Alam niyo ba yung Onesimus, merong kahulugan yon. Yung barong? Na, no, ha? Hindi alam? Uh, one style for men under 65. <laughs> oh. One style for men under. So, government, naka... But really, I have 20 minutes. Ako, five minutes na yata yung intro. Sorry. Natakot ako this introduction eh. But let me make this light, I, I hope. And, um, well, regula regulation is very, very serious. is a very serious matter. Let me make this. Baka inaantok na kayo eh. And I'm, I suppose, gusto na marinig si Atty. Del Delgram hamaya. So, bibilisan lang ho natin. Ano? But uh, really, I'm, I'm happy to be invited here. Thank you, PIDS, to... To actually present how we regulate. I mean, watching your FDA, kanina sabi ko, bugsuyat, maliyata ako kasi yung presentation ko, medyo informal. Dapat yata yung seryoso. Hindi naman. Uh, but, but really, a, a pleasant good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, and I'd thank you for this opportunity to present how the NPC is executing its, its, its mandate. But they have really make a, a, a preamble on why we're here, all right? And if you will look at the, I mean, the Philippine Development Plan of 2040, it says that by 2022 to lay down the foundation for inclusive growth, a high trust and resilient society in a globally competitive knowledge economy, right? So as, as I speak, I mean, government is transforming. I mean, the, all the plans that were laid, Kanina FDI, we are transforming, and we are all transforming digitally. Diba? Hindi naman tayo nagtatransform para bumalik sa papel at lapis, right? So with that, again, maybe, maliwanag na wala, laying down the foundation. So kami po, nila Tony Delgra, we are laying the foundations for this, including the National Privacy Commission, as a commission that was created by the Data Privacy Act of 2012, pero two years ago lang ho kami na, na organize, eh yan naman ho yung asam-asam po natin. Balikan ko lang ho yung ilang mga puntos. Ano. And why we're here is because, well, we'll have to look at data now in a different way. It's the new oil, am I correct? It's a new oil. I mean, look at look at the companies in 2007. No? In 2018, barely 10 years after the, the initial survey, napalitan na ho ang mga kumpanya. Diho ba? Industrial pa noong 2007, but right now, it's it's a, these are companies that are dominating the globe, and what do they have? They have, of course, the technology to process it, but more importantly, the technology to process your data. So your data is fueling what we have, I mean, our dreams, it's fueling our ambition, it's fueling where this country is going. So much so that, of course, oh, sorry sa Grab, andito yung Grab, pero Uber pa nabanggit ko. It's the world's largest stocks. Pero sa Asia, Grab na yata, but they own a vehicle. Ganon din ang Grab, di ba? Wala kayong vehicle pa rin. At Toyota, meron na kayo tie up. No? But Facebook, the world's most popular media owner that creates no content. The world's most valuable retailer that has no inventory, it's Alibaba, and the world's largest accommodation, Airbnb. When what do they have in common? Well, of course, by 2018, they now form part, well, they're in the top 20 of the world's most valuable corporations. The power to process it, data, has been unprecedented. It's the most, well, world's most valuable resource. And again, really fueling the fourth industrial 
revolution. Since 2005 and 2015, cross-border data flows have grown 45 times. Soon, countries' performance will be measured not by uh, GNP or GDP anymore. It will be measured by the amount of data that we transfer to others. In 2015, 15% or 7.5% of the countries of the world's marketplace is online. In two years, it will now, well, they project 15% of the world's um, commerce or marketplace will be online. This is according to the latest McKinsey report. So much so that, well, we are now processing 270 terabytes of data a minute. Kung nagtataka kayo kung gano'ng karami 270 terabytes of data a minute, it's around 1.6 billion selfies a minute. That's yun who yung data transfer natin. Really, and the crux of the matter is what we call aggregation of personal data. The power to process personal data before is in the hands of, well, the large capitalists, the conglomerates, and government. Did you know how much one MB of storage space cost in 1967? One MB. 1967, the year I was born. <laughs> one MB of storage space in 1967 will cost you a million dollars. Nowadays, one MB will cost you, Vic, Makano, two cents. Two cents. All right? Um, meron pa nga akong picture ng gano'ng kalaki ang, ang itsura ng storage nung araw. But alam natin yun. So right now, I mean, the phones that we have, whenever I speak before, I would say, your iPhone is 10,000 times more powerful than the computer that sent man to the moon. I was proven wrong by my second year high school son. That it's a million times more powerful that the computer that sent man to the moon. Remember you moving Apollo, diba? Apollo, yung kay Tom Hanks? Right, remember that? Diba? They had, diba? They had to power yung computer nila, konting-konti lang. 64 KB lang yung kailangan nun eh. That's why they were able to do it. 64, Sa sabi mo kang tama yung anak ko. Because we, we now have that power to process this. So it has brought a lot of good, a lot of good services. It has really, our companies have become more competitive, diba? Government no, has been able to come up with services too. The potential for good has never been better. Better healthcare, better services, better governance. The DIC has laid on a very ambitious plan. So yun po, yun ho mangyayari ho sa atin. As we grow and transform digitally, there will be more services that will be available to the common man. Kasi, you know, makano ba cellphone yun? 2,000 pesos sa Lazada. Right? But the potential for bad is also there. The wrong use of data, unauthorized disclosure, fraudulent use, that can cause what? It can cause discrimination. People are discriminated because of their race, color, or ethnic origin. Did you know in the United States, I just read it in Forbes magazine before, 60% of human resource managers admit that they rely on your Facebook page to decide whether you are going to hire you or not. Okay, so, and of course, unfair decision making based on profiling every day. We do that. You know, I ako disabled yung Facebook ko eh, yung account ko. But before that, I would, you know, nonchalantly click. Yung paminsan minsan pa like like, di ba? Like. But did you know that yung like button is the most processed feature of Facebook? Did you notice that? Mag-like ka sa aso, subukan nyo. Namaya mayroon ng dog food na <laughs> commercial sa email mo. So, that's it, nag-like ka. Mag-like ka sa Maldives or whatever, the place na magaganda na ba. But later on, nandiyan namang mga offerings na sa'yo. So they profile you that way. But sometimes they will decide not to include you based on what? They decide on you, ikaw lang, ito yung servisyo para sa'yo, itong produkto para sa'yo, itong hindi para sa'yo. 
identity theft, of course. No? Always this case of a public school teacher who after passing the professional regulatory commission exam for license for licensure, pinost yung kanyang ID di ba, sa Facebook, and lo and behold, eight months after, meron ng naniningil sa kanya, nangutang pala using his name. So kawawan teacher, bagong bagong nagturo, may utang ka agad. Marami mo nangyayari sa atin dyan. And of course, loss of reputation. Hmm. Ito po yung mga maaaring mangyari ho saan. Remember that case, in, it was in Cebu where this person underwent a sensitive procedure and then later on uh, spills a web yung kanyang video, with the video taken by doctors. Uh, I see people nodding, remember that, right? And he was judged according to a video that was illegally uploaded. Loss of autonomy, I mean, they were mentioning that kanina, no? Somebody got, you know, his name was put up there as a suspect in a road rage incident, and his life was never the same again. Eventually, I, I showed you this because a local court actually found the editor of the on an online company that published his name as, well, liable for damage. So, and worldwide, hindi lang tayo, as I speak, there are 128 other jurisdictions, jurisdictions in the world that recognize the benefits of all this, but also recognize the harm that is present. You know, and for government, one thing I learned, dalawa lang naman ginagawa natin sa gobyerno, di ba? To provide and to protect. So, we need to protect each and every one of you in the digital lives that we now lead. Hindi lang po tayong isa dyan. If you look at jurisdictions all over the world, you look at Singapore, Malaysia, and even the EU, if you notice, in May, suddenly you got so many notices of um, renewals of public, you know, your private uh, privacy policies, acceptance. It's because they introduced a new law. Well, amended their old law to introduce new, tougher measures for data protection in the EU. So, hindi ho tayo nag-iisa dyan, kahit na po ang batas po natin ay nagsasabi ng ganito. Our law is quite punitive when it protects the personal data of its citizens. Concealing a breach, malicious disclosure, access due to negligence, government, I mean, I'm calling all of you here in government. Ito ang pag-iingatan natin. Somebody accesses personal data within your or under your care. Ito ho yung isa sa pinaka malapit na pwede nyo hantungan. Access due to negligence. It has a jail term of one to three years, three years to six if the data is sensitive. Passport data is considered sensitive. Yun ang closest na sasabihin ko sa isyong yan. <laughs> Kasi iniimbestigahan po namin. You have unauthorized processing, unauthorized purpose, improper disposal. Okay? Nangyayari po yan. And concealing a breach. If you hide the breach from us, meron din pong jail term yan and fine. Malicious disclosure and a combination of acts will net you all this. You know, nung pong last year, bago pa lang po yung NPC, dalawang taong pa lamang po, dalawa, well, a few months, pero nung 2017, we got 221 complaints. Right now, October pa lang po yan, sorry, hindi pa po namin na-update, pero 834 na. In terms of breach noti notification, we had 60 nung pong 2017. From January to October last year, we had 302, so five-fold na ho ang any increase. Again, of course, we look at this, all this happening all over us, all over the globe. One of the 55 million that uh, came out of Comelec, ito po yung lumalabas, uh, NPC, we are addressing the Facebook issue. Cafe Pacific, for example, no? when they got breached, a lot of Filipinos also present there. Even Jollibee, you know? ABS-CBN. So how are we actually running or implementing our mandate, if you will see? So we go back here to the basis of the law. It's an act protecting personal data in systems, in government, and in private. 
Yan po, meron ba sinasabi sa Act Protecting Privacy Rights? Wala. Because the logic here is that if we protect data, if we protect your data, we protect your welfare and rights in a digital society. Five minutes na lang, nakubitin. Intro pa lang yun eh. <laughs> Whew, sige. Okay, but si Senator, the late Senator Angara po, siya po ang father ng law na ito. So for starters, sino ba nakabasa na ng batas? Taas ang kamay. Oh, di nga. Talaga? The quiz ko kayo. But really, it's, 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 it's basically what's stated here by uh, Senator Angara. It's an act making it mandatory for data collectors, whether in public or to protect the security, integrity, confidentiality of data. And by doing such, we usher in that knowledge-driven economy. Okay? Ito lamang pong paliwanag dyan. Tungkol ba saan ng DPAs, uh, acknowledging the rights of data subjects over their data and enforcing the responsibilities of those who process them. Ito ho yung basic principle niya. May karapatan ho tayo over data. I binabalik po ng batas na ito yung control natin sa sarili nating data. Dahil tayo ho na ayaw na, na naiinis na na araw-araw, may nagtatext sa atin ang di natin kilala. At magtataka ka kung bakit sa niya nakuha yun. Loss of autonomy. These are the daily cases of that. So kami as a regulator, alam niyo mahaba, diba? Easy read ba yung batas, Ludi? Naintindihan mo sa unang basa? Hindi. O, simple lang ho kami. Sisimplehan ko lang sa inyo. Ano ba ang ginagawa ho ngayon ng batas na ito? We encourage good behavior in processing personal information. Ang sweet, no? Diba? And we discourage bad behavior in processing. Simple lang. Ang hindi ko na nasama niyan, we have to keep it in budget. <laughs> we have to come up with a cost-effective way to do that. I have to mention that because government's resources is really finite. And I guess that defines also how we regulate. Because we cannot, I mean, if you have to address almost 800,000 companies and 107 million Filipinos, how do you do that with a budget that is present in government. So, ang hindi wala hong line dyan is, we have to do this in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. These are our functions. Sa amin ng opisina, pag pumunta kayo doon, even who yung pinaka-staff who na, yung pinapamemorize, well, well, lahat who yung, it's, it's, we make rules, we provide advice, we promote privacy, we handle complaints, we monitor compliance, and we enforce the law. Ako, mayroon ho kaming, ano yan, eh, mnemonics, RAP CCE. So, employees ko pinapamemor. We make rules, we give advice, we promote privacy, we handle complaints, we uh, uh, check for compliance, and we enforce the law. Mas madali ho sa aming maintindihan ito, pinapaintindihan namin sa aming mga kasama kung ano ang roles namin. Yan ho ang function sa amin ng batas. But very important, maintindihan namin, ang roles ho namin ay apat. We are a leader because we need to teach everyone this. We're also a police enforcer. Police din kami. We're also a complaints handler because we have to observe, I mean, citizens, support citizens' complaints. And lastly, we are an authorizer because we issue rules, we certify. Just recently, we have launched our Data Protection Officer Certification Program. So we are ready to certify Data Protection Officers. So yung mga nasa government po dito, who among you here are DPOs or Designated Data Protection Officers? Wala pa? Kayo ma'am? Anong agency kayo? Bank of? Ah, okay. DPO kayo for private. All right. So yun po yung malaking kampanya ho natin dito this year. Uh, we must thank the DBM. Dinagdagan ho nila yung budget namin with a specific proviso that we ensure government compliance. So ito nangyari ho sa DFA, DFA uh, really a clarion call for government. This May, we will be launching a national conference for DPOs in government. So ganun po yun lang yung effort po ng ating administrasyon na, uh, you're asking, di ba, ano ba dapat na mangyari is to train the people to become 
data stewards, I mean, the Azure Data Protection Officer. So on how we will assay our role as a leader, police officer, complaints handler, and authorizer, I think that's the mix that we have to really master because in doing so, these roles must be able to predict and pre prevent risks, detect it, and enforce the law. Predicting it, meaning if we can anticipate the needs of companies and even government of uh, agencies, prevent it from occurring to mga risks, threats, and harms NATO, detecting it, and enforcing the law. Our vision, regulatory vision, is very, very clear. We want to enable widespread trust in businesses. You know, I was guesting kanina umaga sa isang TV show and there was a man on the street interview at sinasabi niya, yung nangyari sa DFA, really, yung question, kaila, papano ko pagtitiwalaan ng kopyano? Yun po yung issue eh. Because in the digital world, alam naman po natin, yan ho ang puhunan dyan. Trust. Both in private practice, private commerce, and government. So trust in government will be measured now. Time's up na. Sige po, konti na lang. Kung paano ho patutupan ng gobyerno at sisiguraduhin na protektado ang kanyang mamamayan. But overall, we, this is what we want to happen. When government and business can be trusted, we'll have more, I mean, prosperous business uh, going on concern so it can employ more people. There will be social stability and there could be more innovation. So this leads to um, totally leading towards that path that eventually it will lead to this. So our goal as a data privacy authority, again, prevention of data use that will impair the quality of your life and promote a society where good quality of life flows from genuine and widespread privacy. One thing, silver lining ng sa nangyari over the weekend, Nung nag-raise si, nag si Secretary Loxin at dinagsa din siya ng mga tweet ng iba, so many people are asking now sensible questions about it. To the point, di ba, sabi ni Secretary Loxin, kayo na mag-push niyan, hindi ko. And so many people are, are aware. So here's the, our regulatory function. We can go that route. Harsh punishment. Total, nandiyan naman yan, sinabi ng batas. Or ito po, modern approach tayo. Acting fairly, proportionately, due process because ultimately this is what we realize all right people will obey our rules if it's based on our values and people will obey it if they understand it's being implemented fairly and applied well applied fairly and it has been made fairly agree tama ba yon oh fair lang tayo dito ah oh sige so beyond compliance this is what we want to happen we want data privacy to be part of culture and corporate responsibility. Kasi wala hong enough resources kami para bantayan kayong lahat. Agree? So kailangan ho bantayan natin ang mga sarili natin, mga negosyo natin. And through that, yan po lang pinapasunod ho natin. Commit to appoint your DPO, assess your risk, have a privacy management program, demonstrate your compliance, and be prepared for a breach. Yan lang po ang limang pillars ng pinapatupad ng NPC. So sa magsasabi sa inyo, mahirap naman sumunod sa regulation nyo, yan lang ho ang aming tinitignan. At ito po nga po ang aming pang ginagawa. We emphasize advice, giving advice, information, engaging in dialogue and support. That's what we call responsive regulation and constructive engagement. Ibilis lang ko na. You know, Ito yung approach naman. We've been talking to industry. There are now 20 industries that we have consolidated under the deep. Ayun yung maniwala, ayam po yan. Iniisa-isa ho namin sila. We're working with associations and forming, again, um, explaining the law. Para ho, naka DPO 20 na ho kami. We've done, of course, aggressive in... in, in. You, you, you Please go to our website. Only three things that you could do there. You know more about privacy, you can complain, and you can comply. Walang fake news done. So, kasama ho lahat itong initiatives na ito because finally, this is how we will look at industry. Ito na ho ang pinaka-importante dyan. Dalawa na lang ho ang tingin namin sa mga kumpanya at gobyerno. Nagko-comply ka ba o hindi ka nagko-comply? If you're not complying, dalawa na rin hong klase yan. Yun ho talagang hindi sumusunod 
enforcement ang kailangan dyan. O yun naman talaga medyo ignorante lang. Kailangan tulungan. Tulong muna bago hila, sabi ng MMDA. At compliant naman. So compliant, dalawa rin yung klase yan. Yung punta lang ng punta sa mga meeting namin, magpapaselfie sa akin, sabihin, boss, pag sa company nila, boss, compliant na tayo, nag-selfie ako kay commissioner, okay na tayo. But this is what we want to reach. No? Operational compliance. Where every company, again, makes data privacy part of their culture, where everyone is practicing data ethics because this is what we want to have. By year 2022, sana. Yan ho. Ako, ambition nito. Pero this year, it's the year of protecting the digital Filipinos. So join us, please. Next year, the year of the DPO, Data Protection Officer. In Europe, they need 80,000 DPOs. Yung tango nyo, ano ba yun? Gugugal nyo kagad yun, ano? Tingin yung requirement. <laughs> and, you know, private companies, your data, and privacy resilience, and sana nga po yun. And our roadmap is quite clear, okay? So, ito po yung pinapatapot po namin. We want everyone to internalize our five pillars of accountability, compliance, and ethics program. Second, certifications and seals. Padating na po yan. We will be certifying companies, we will be certifying professionals. So when you do that, now third, level up na tayo. Kailangan pumasa na ho tayo lahat sa international certification, if necessary. Because kailangan po sa ginagawa ho natin, ma-realize ho na ibang bansa that we are good stewards of data. And lastly, the privacy code of conduct. When everyone else, lahat ho tayo nag-comply, Lahat ng indices na binanggit mo natin will come up with their own sectoral code based on our law when it is being practiced as a culture, as a corporate responsibility, medyo bibitaw na ang gobyerno doon. Titingin na lang kami. Babalingan na lang namin yung talagang willfully hindi nagko-comply kasi nga po, doon na namin nititrain talaga yung resources namin. Right now, ito ho yung roadmap po natin. So lastly, sabi nga nila, law students that are seldom obeyed, too severe, it's seldom executed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Liboro. Uh, you know, we really are in a, in a very different world with all the digital footprints that we have been leaving behind uh, for people to harvest. And uh, so the, the, the task set upon to, by, uh, by the, the law that we have uh, to the National Privacy Commission is quite um, overwhelming, to, do, to say the least. Uh, we, are, we have invited uh, three people to give their discussions, but unfortunately, our first uh, discussant Consta uh, Representative Constant Kindness, Joey Sarsel Salceda, has uh, sends his the regrets that he is unable to be here uh, due to uh, a uh, you know it's one of the things about pol politicians there something comes up last minute <laughs> um, and so we were uh, he he sends uh, his, his his regrets. Um, we would now turn to our next discussant. Uh, uh, who is a, a friend and, and, and the dean of the uh, uh, an associate professor of the Ateneo School of Government? Uh, he ha he was previously you know, um, the uh, working as an associate professor of the Asian Institute of Management, where he also was executive director of the Policy Center you know, for for competitiveness. And prior to that, he worked with the UN uh, in U UNICEF, especially, and UN UNDP, as well as the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Uh, Ron Mendoza, uh, he finished his degree, bachelor's degree from uh, the Ateneo and uh, his uh, master's in public administration and international development from the Kennedy School of Government of Harvard, and uh, eventually his uh, master's and doctoral degrees in economics from Fordham. Uh, Ron?
Thank you very much, Toots, and our good friends from PIDS for this chance to share with you some candid thoughts on the regulatory environment in our country today. I'm uh, getting a little bit of a reputation as sort of a disruptor as far as reacting to presentations are concerned. Uh, so I will carry on with this tradition and sort of be a little critical uh, and share with you some candid thoughts on, on what I'm seeing from my point of view. Of course, I have this luxury since I do not serve in government. Uh, and uh, this is to be considered as the general observations of someone who is not a regulator, nor is a regulatory scholar, but is familiar with some of the regulatory thinking and scholarship, uh, which I quickly read up on when I was given this task. Let me begin. I have a lot to say. Innovation typically poses challenges and opportunities for public policy and regulation. It is a double-edged sword. Innovation is usually born out of necessity and also opportunity. It can emerge in areas to circumvent regulations, which have become onerous, or in areas where there are no regulations yet. The question at hand is how can regulators prepare for more disruptive innovations in the era of the fourth industrial revolution? Let me note here a few ideas that might serve as food for thought for us, drawing on the thinking of regulatory scholars abroad. The first is the issue of self-regulation. Self-regulation by the private sector could be effective in supporting better functioning goods and services markets. Government regulation is also an option, but in many cases proves to be unwieldy and in addition could carry the risks of state and regulatory capture. Facebook Philippines' recent decision to purge the system of troll accounts is one example of self-regulation. Let me quote, this specific investigation began after we learned that Twinmark was selling admin rights to Facebook pages it had created in order to increase distribution and generate profit, which violates our spam policy, ultimately uncovering a large network of pages and accounts that were engaging in coordinated, inauthentic behavior. The use of fake accounts, leading people to ad farms, and so on and so forth. What does this example give us? Broad questions have been raised on modern technologies and what options we have as far as regulating the emergence of these technologies. These have actually been triggered way, way before and not simply today through the emergence of what we call the sharing economy and more network technologies coming online. Not all of these uh, companies opt for self-regulation. For instance, in 2000, a US federal court shut down Napster, a music sharing app. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but I was in graduate school, an avid uh, sort of follower and supporter of Napster. Uh, but it was shut down while I was uh, sort of one of the users, one of the 70 million users back then. Um, a music sharing app, but Napster was not, was not only the first, was the first of a bigger wave of innovation, which would eventually destroy brick and mortar based industries. So a mere nine years after Napster was shut down, Virgin Megastore in Times Square, New York, which was the iconic brick and mortar model, was actually closed down as well. So the shutting down of Napster did not end, did not fully protect the old technology. Eventually it was becoming redundant. My second point is on regulatory learning. Agencies, and the, I, I, I'm really happy to hear this theme coming out from some of the presentations. Agencies can also look for other opportunities to promote regulatory learning. The Administrative Conference of the United States recently encouraged agencies to do precisely that, issuing a recommendation on learning from regulatory experience. Among other things, this recommendation encourages agencies to engage in quasi-experiments. So I'm very happy to hear from the BSP presentation that they have the same thinking on testing regulations. Carefully comparing parties subject to different regulatory treatments to attempt to isolate the effects of regulation. This might entail comparing firms that are slightly above and slightly below a regulatory threshold. For those of us in the econometrics uh, practice, this is regression discontinuity, classic example. Or analyzing the comparative performance of businesses that have obtained regulatory waivers and those that have not. This kind of learning is critically important because we don't want regulators to end up creating unintended consequences. First, my good friend, 
author of the great book on unintended consequences yun. Too many regulations actually creating more harm than good. Or creating good, but uh, the sort of unintended harm that is married to that good. Uh, for example, is regulating Uber effectively? Uh, one example is regulating Uber effectively, in my view, in my personal view but probably weakening competition in the transport space because of this very same regulation. How many of us also saw a deterioration in the services of Uber's main competitor when Uber disappeared from the scene? I do not have empirical evidence to support this, whether it is a generalizable observation, but just judging from the comments of many friends and my own personal experience, there was a dramatic deterioration in services when the competition was not there. And of course, let me not even talk about our cabs. It's a pleasure to note again that the BSP has shared this. I'm going to skip a little bit that part. My third point is on the cost-benefit analysis for regulation. And I think I heard part of this also in the presentations earlier. Retrospective review of regulation could be useful, and in particular, the use of cost-benefit analysis tools in this review process. Two recent executive orders signed by President Donald Trump Executive Orders 13,771 and 13,777 are good examples and they effectively impose a limit on both the numbers and costs of new regulations. So Trump is not always up to sort of uh, destructive <laughs> uh, activities. No, some of what he does is actually quite useful. This is one of those useful things. Uh, these two executive orders, um, basically implement a learning element attached to this. The regulatory task forces created by these EO should seek input from a wide array of stakeholders in determining which rules to revise and which to eliminate. In so doing, the task forces should especially focus on obtaining input from consumer groups and small businesses whose input might otherwise be crowded out by the beneficiaries of the status quo. So let me just go to that point on the status quo. <coughs> And uh, probably my last point, that navigating the political economy of regulation is extremely critical. A regulated environment as well as an unregulated environment will both have different stakeholders whose interests may or may not be aligned with the greater public good. Navigating the emerging political economy of regulation could aid regulatory agencies in their strategy. Changing regulatory landscape with new technologies will force many agencies on constant change management. It will force many agencies in constant change management. I note our colleague from FDA chided COA for not keeping up with the times, for instance. COA is not the only agency to fail to keep up with the times. But more of our regulators will feel this challenge. And how many of our regulatory agencies and regulatory managers are equipped with change management skills. So even within the regulatory agency, there will be a pushback on new types of regulations and new ways of thinking. Leveraging the support of the broader number of citizens and stakeholders can probably help improve the effectiveness of regulators, which ideally should know when, where, and how to regulate. In the end, regulations are only tools. The ultimate objective is not effective regulation per se, because as the technology landscape changes, so too should our regulatory tools and frameworks. Ultimately, the main objective is the promotion of the public good. I have more things to say about big data, but I think my time is up. Thanks. All right, uh, now we would like to call on uh, our next discussant, who is a fellow of, of the Foundation for Economic Freedom. He is also the Chief Executive Officer of Symmetrix Fixed Income Partners Incorporated, which is a fintech firm based in Manila, focused on the distribution of uh, OTC securities across ASEAN markets. He, is a, he holds an MBA um, from Wharton School of, uh, School of the University of Pennsylvania, and he also has a bachelor's degree from the Ateneo. Seems uh, nobody's from La Salle, no? Okay. <laughs> Just joking. Okay, may I call on Mr. Renan Paglin?
thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, I think um, I'd just like to share with you uh, some <coughs> interesting anecdote that I, that I saw. And I think it, it uh, bears a lot of light in uh, the current situation we are, OK? Uh, as you know, uh, Philippines is internationalizing. And there are a lot of foreign workers in, in our country today. Uh, they're, they're focused in some, some areas, but from a small group, they've actually, the economy is getting quite large. You know, they have their own grocery store, they have their own restaurants, their own beauty parlor, everything. But you know what's interesting? They don't need peso at all to interact in this economy. Why? Because their economy is so advanced they have the ability to pay. They're paid through their cell phone. They spend through their cell phone. The merchants that ser serve them accept payment through their cell phone. They don't need pesos at all. They don't need to step into a Philippine bank at all. And their economy is growing very, very fast. So this is a starting from a very small base getting to a very large base. And guess what? I bet they're not paying BIR either, you know? It's the foreign government that's taxing them. Because it's the foreign government that's monitoring their system. OK? What does this mean? It means, Philippines, you got to learn very, very fast. You're going to get left behind very fast. OK? So I think the lesson here, we have so many problems. We're talking about a very, very big uh, you know, I just talking, uh, I think um, Tito Ortiz uh, hit, hit uh, and I think the same message came from uh, many speakers that uh, there's, you know, th th there's so many regulations, there's so many agencies, and there's so many silo approach. The fact is, the dragon's very big. You know, I mean, if we're going to try to solve the dragon, it's very big. Now, if we look at the success story of this foreign group here. And we look at some of, we don't have to look at our recent history today. We can look at uh, even history during the last 100 years. It has never been fixing the big. It has always been fixing the small to teach the big. What do I mean? If, if we look at the biggest success stories in Asia, our neighbors, Take a, take a look at China. China was the most impoverished country 100 years ago or 50 years ago. But what happened was a small part of China was carved out, Hong Kong. And they started from scratch. They said, we're going to start a system that will work in a small place. Of course, it was much easier to make things work because it was small. But the success story of this small place, Hong Kong, Instead of China dragging Hong Kong down, Hong Kong dragged China up. Because there's nothing like success that makes success. So once you say, Hong Kong successful, let's follow Hong Kong, OK? So drag all of China to, to, to follow Hong Kong. The, China's not the only example in Hong Kong. I would submit Malaysia and Singapore have, the same, have, have had the same history. You should know, uh, 50 years ago, Singapore is part of Malaysia. And Malaysia is poorer than the Philippines. Okay, what happened? Singapore spun off, made their own small economy, and made rules that actually, because it's a small place, they were able to make rules that work, and it was easier to implement. And the success story of, Malay of Singapore propelled competition and propelled Malaysia to copy. So, the, the, the amazing thing is the, when you have a success, success, success story in the small, the big is pulled up to the small. Now, what do I mean by this? I think the time has come, and I think uh, BSP has also talked about this a little bit, uh, called uh, regulatory sandbox. But I think this concept, it's time for us to apply it in a similar way. I think we should have the enabling legislation to pick a sub-economy. Doesn't have to be 
the whole country. Pick a town, pick a PESA zone, pick a university. Pick something that is a microcosm, a, shall we call a ecosystem that's diversified enough, not huge, diversified enough to be a model for the country. And then starts from scratch in there. Take out all the regulations that don't make sense for the whole country. Let's say, let's treat this as a, um, a sandbox. Let's try to implement regulations that make sense using the fourth industrial revolution, using technology. And let's make BIR work with BSP. You know, uh, 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 the whole thing about uh, FinTech has been talking about FinTech all the time, about being uh, exclusive, inclusive technology to bring uh, the people who are unbanked into the system. But you know what hasn't been discussed is the same technology that will bring the unbanked into the system is the same technology that will bring the underground economy into the, into the tax base. But that has never been discussed, but it's actually the same thing can bring to the tax base. So if we can bring the whole economy that's benefiting, then we can reduce the taxes for everyone because we can increase the, we can increase the tax base. So there's a lot of room for innovation for cooperation of the different regulators. But it's going to be very, very difficult if you're gonna try to change the whole country in one go. It's, I think we take the lesson from what we're learning from this foreign group and set up the framework, set up the legislation so that these regulators can say, okay, for this, we'll set up a framework for a, an ecosystem and start from scratch make it 21st century. And when that becomes a success story, that will spread very fast. So th that's just my only suggestion, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Randon. And uh, now we're going to have a 15 minute break for coffee or tea. Uh, and then after that, uh, we will be continuing with our open forum, thank you.
others to proceed because we have so many things hampering us. Some of them in the Constitution, some in the regulations invented, and oftentimes in relation to the fact that uh, we have created a mindset of development which was in effect uh, produced for us by the restrictive assumptions of uh, the, the restrictive provisions of the Constitution we had in 1935. Now, perhaps we can, we can develop that dialogue and bring us up to date on how we might remove, uh, we might adjust the system. Okay, so we have two questions uh, that are directed to the LTFRB. Uh, first, uh, uh, regarding ANCAS, and the second about uh, possible ideas of experiments of a regula uh, regarding a regulatory sandbox similar to what was done by BSP. And the third is, um, we, we go back to uh, Renan, uh, who, who triggered this idea of making an experiment of sorts uh, uh, given the binding constraints that we face in the economy. First, perhaps we throw the, um, uh, the mic to the LTFRB chair. I know. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator Gachalan. Uh, um, there were uh, a number of items that were mentioned about ANCAS and related to it. <coughs> There was a mention about incompetence, corruption, and ANCAS itself. So I'll start off with corruption. Um, <clears throat> when I came in with, uh, came into office, LTFRB, I said earlier, this is my first stint in government. So when I came in, the marching order to me, uh, <clears throat> on the night that we were presented to media, on uh, May 30, 2016, was he told me, corrupt yang ahensya mo. And that's what I did in the first six months. That's why there's not much uh, discussion about how we're going to address routes uh, and the lack of it, the lack of public transport. It's about taking over 100 employees over a period of time, and even until now, no? just to address that. Because if we have a corrupt agency, we will have a problem about addressing the mandate that we have put in place uh, on ourselves. Second, <clears throat> on the issue of having to address, uh, again, ANCAS, no? um, ANCAS, we look at it, I look at it in three ways. ANCAS as a mode, no? pretty much like Habal Habal in the provinces, ANCAS as a brand, and ANCAS as a TNC. Okay. Uh, TNC meaning technology base. Now, when you talk about ANCAS, obviously, everyone is doing that. Tama po kayo, no? When you say that the government is incompetent because there are so many habal habal all across the country, hindi po natin tinatago yan. It's a realidad, no? And it is reflective of uh, the lack of public transport, even in the provinces. Uh, it might be highlighted na yung pangalan na angkas <clears throat> is so because uh, media and its focus in Metro Manila. But there are a lot more of this angkas as a mode which are not authorized, because none is authorized on uh, a two-wheel vehicle as a public transport all across the country. No? And uh, having said that, that's precisely why <coughs> uh, Secretary Tugade have uh, directed the creation of a uh, technical working group no? uh, on the, in order to push forward the discussion on whether uh, uh, motorcycle taxi, now we call it as a motorcycle taxi, may be allowed, and if may be allowed, under what circumstances. Uh, what that means is that we have to set certain regulations. Any authority, any franchise given by government, obviously uh, assumes certain level of regulation uh, uh, over that particular service. No? So yun yung sinasabi natin. Uh, in so far as TNC, as, uh, I mean ANCAS as a TNC, we would like to set the record straight. Uh, LTFRB has nothing against ANCAS as a TNC. No? They could have been accredited as a TNC, just like Grab, Here Na Hype, Auto, uh, MyCab, and all the rest, and all the other uh, TNCs that we have accredited. It was only uh, the use of motorcycle as their means of transporting passengers. That is the core of the issue. 
And that said, the law does not allow it at the moment. And uh, as you can see, even if uh, the RTC of Mandaluyong granted a reprieve to Angkas, it was overturned by another TRO issued by the Supreme Court. So that is where we are now. So I think the, the issue here is having to address it in a, uh, <clears throat> in a legislative manner. No? In fact, um, the other day, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The other day, we had a roundtable discussion before the Committee uh, on Transport uh, in the House. And um, there were already pending bills, even before this ANCAS issue came to, came to uh, the um, <coughs> public view um, starting last year. There were still some bills that I filed as early as 2016, um, pushing for the regulation of motorcycle taxi. Tawag po dyan, taxi dahil po, it, it is pretty much like a taxi service. Wala pong rota ito. You know? You take a taxi, you go anywhere you want to go. Yun yung, kaya nga, they coin it motorcycle taxi. So yun po ang gusto nating klaruhin. No? Uh, <clears throat> and for that matter, the technology that is in Angkas or in Grab or anything else, as I've said earlier, maganda po yun. No? Uh, we are not anti-technology. I like to say that again and again in all the, uh, whenever there is an issue that is brought about because of what we did to Uber, hindi po uh, anti-technology yung, uh, yung gobyerno. Yeah, well, in so far as LTFRB and DOTR is concerned. We just want to set the level, level playing field. No? We also understand, and this is perhaps where we can get inputs from you, that uh, technology and innovation uh, is developed faster than we can regulate them in that sense. So I, uh, those are the realities. No? Uh, but then again, umaangal yung nauuna. Okay, I'm sorry, umaangal yung naiiwan. Hindi naman ibig sabihin din na ko yung uh, pagdating sa regulation because the, that I think is the uh, equalizer when you talk about public transport. Because when you talk about public transport, talagang uh, there is a level of regulation, as I've said earlier, when you issue an authority for somebody to run uh, a franchise. No? Um, uh, as regards yung mga innovative ideas po, yung sinasabi po natin na yung mga technology that are already there, we have put it in place in so far as the other mode of public transport is concerned. So yung taxi, wala pa pong uh, apps, ngayon meron na po. So nire-require po natin yung taxi to avail of the, uh, because we act the other year, we actually have granted a fair increase to taxi, which they never had um, almost 10 years. So uh, we granted uh, an increase in the fare, but they can only enjoy that uh, if they would be able to put an apps in the taxi unit. So if you want to take a taxi right now, you can probably take, uh, there are actually TNCs which are dedicated to the taxi service. Yeah? Here na Grab uh, and even uh, MyCab are actually doing that now. No? Uh, <clears throat> So yun po, uh, among other things also on the safety side, uh, we've been pushing uh, dash cam as well as um, uh, having to understand yung mas malaki ang perspective no? uh, in terms of addressing public need, public transport needs. Uh, we're looking at having to transform, for example, uh, General Santos City from a city with so many tricycles to a, to a city that will run on uh, environment-friendly, reliable public transport under the context of a local public transport route plan. Na? So, ibig sabihin yung sinasabi kong interconnectivity of routes. Predictable po yung ride na yan. So, yung, the one that we have put in place about having to set regulation, first of all, ang gusto ko lang intindihin din na yung regulation na yan is not about having to enforce it. Mas mabuti when you put certain regulations, you're actually putting up certain systems that if it will run perfectly, I don't think we'll reach that point where we have to enforce it. Kasi tumatakbo ng maayos. Yun ang gusto nating sabihin. Okay. Uh, Rana? Um, could you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, I, it seems uh, um, Dr. Sikat was 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 pointing out that there have uh, you you sort of triggered the idea your your last statement about possible experiments of sorts that seem to be uh, a good way of 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 recognizing that this might be a good way of of, of getting out of the, the systems problem we are facing because yes. uh, we we we're not 
it's, it seems to be very hard to, to change the entire system in the country. So yes. perhaps doing things in, in an experiment of sorts, so can you try to expound a little bit more? Uh, well, I, I'm in the financial space. I obviously work with BSP uh, on many things uh, quite closely. Uh, so I think the, obviously the, um, the fourth industrial revolution is about data. It's about information. And uh, there's nothing more that's pure uh, information based but money. Uh, and so I think that um, a lot of things can be um, very, made very efficient. Uh, I, I was just reading a uh, forward looking using um, um, money or information as a technology can solve a lot of things. For example, if you had a pure, of course, with NPC, with the importance of data privacy, there's that, there's that balance. But in theory, you could have something, uh, you could have a, an economy where all the transactions are, are digitized, which means that uh, you don't need to file tax returns because uh, you will be taxed properly. You don't, everybody, the credit information is based on real time, your real revenue. So uh, risk can be perfectly managed. Uh, you're not gonna have a, a corrupt tax enforcer because you don't need human tax enforcers. They're all going to be computerized. You, you can do public service in a very dedicated way. For example, uh, instead of having public schools, uh, and, you, and, 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 and uh, you can have uh, the private sector compete on quality of education, and instead of the government um, uh, providing the school, what the government provides is vouchers, which are used in, in the public education system. So all, all of these things, almost sound like science fiction. You know, uh, um, how can this all, all happen? But it's possible. All of these things are, are, might all happen in the 21st century. And uh, the question is whether we're gonna get there or we're, we're just gonna be get taken over. Because I, I, as I mentioned before, there's foreign people from foreign countries now who are very, have, have built without any regulatory support they built a thriving economy using their own money, <laughs> digital, and because it's, al it's already there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we chat, <laughs> so you can guess who it is. Uh, but I think, um, and, and, and with Dr. Sikat, I, I had mentioned this um, because, I, for example, um, maybe a key part to start this is to dovetail it with the tax legislation, which is now before the, you know, uh, I think we should focus on, Hey, it's not just uh, let's not just focus on 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 changing the tax system based on our past past history. Let's put a provision there to allow our regulators to to make a carve out. You know, let's let's pick this whether it's a small town, whether it's a university, whether it's an economic zone, or whether it's something pure, purely virtual. Mm -hmm. Give them the regulatory power to say, okay, we'll do a carve out like a sandbox. Work with BSP, work with DOF, work with that every to make a pure 21st century digital technology. So we don't need to be um, uh, worry about the big picture. Let's focus on the small, mm -hmm. make it perfect, and success will speak for itself. Because then we'll be able to bring the best practice that we learned there. That's the best way to climb the learning curve, mm -hmm. I think. Otherwise, okay. we won't get there. Okay. <laughs> All right, so may, perhaps we could have uh, another round of questions. Yeah, oh, sure, yes. Um. Uh, I'll try to respond to the WF example. You know, before when the law, our law in, on privacy is pretty nascent, right? And traction, um, I mean, for its traction in the industry, uh, you, you have to come up with a myriad of ways on how to introduce this law. But one thing is for sure, all the countries around us, in fact, in the, in the ASEAN region alone just this December, Indonesia and Thailand just enacted their own comprehensive law on data privacy. And in May this year, I was, as I was mentioning uh, earlier, the European Union amended their uh, old, well, well, relatively old, they call it the EU 95 directive that contained 
privacy regime in the EU. During that time, uh, we were already promoting our five pillars of accountability and compliance, and we're already doing the industry approach. But there was a tremendous interest then that came from the manning industry. Because then they realized, well, before, that they were pretty quiet, that their cross-border dealings and transactions are now under the EU's new regime. So from our end, you know, uh, they, they, now they realize that if, in, if they ignore the local legislation or regulation here, they could not escape now the regulatory, the new regulatory regime in the EU. So when the Scandinavian shipping um, companies started asking them, where's your privacy policy? Are you conducting your privacy impact assessment? Do you have the DPOs? Then they realize now the importance of our own local legislation. So what I'm saying is that all these, I think, regis uh, regulate, regulatory, um, the laws that we implement is not actually existing in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. It's also our way, I mean, uh, in 2012, the law was enacted. Uh, we're, we're, we're actually already playing catch up when it mm -hmm. comes to, there are a lot, 124 other jurisdictions that have come ahead of us. Soon, and I think this would really be a barrier for trade. Mm -hmm. And just like what the experience, the experience of mining, our counterparts, your business counterparts abroad, will now be asking you, do you have your data protection officer? Mm -hmm. In the law, it was not, you know, it, those who have read the law, it did not stay there to appoint your DPO. What is stated there was you have to have an accountable officer. What I did was name it a DPO because we were already anticipating that the EU will be requiring a DPO. So yung ginagawa ho natin dito, we must think, no, kung nahihirapan ho tayo dito, mas nagihigpit na rin ho sa labas. Now, for government to also, eh, well, again, in spite of government now, we, we're not only talking of how our regulation is also affecting local, the domestic market. We have to deal with them internationally. And we have to convince them that our law here is robust enough for them to trust us to process their citizens' information. So when we, much as we would want, for example, to um, loosen up or, you know, uh, you know, pabayaan natin yung ganun, ano? Hindi ho, baka hindi po masayang businesses natin. So, because they're starting, they're starting to require that. What I want to, what we want to happen is for us to take advantage of this. We can turn this into an advantage. That's why you know, arming effort to do this. Now, and, and, and right now, companies are realizing that. So, sabi ko matutuloy yung sabi nga namin, enlightened self-interest. Mm -hmm. Obviously, our, you know, we're a very young agency. We cannot reach all the companies. But from from where we're, we're you know uh, right now what we are trying to build is provide all the tools present and this is what we have to say the npc we are not the gatekeepers of what can or cannot be done <laughs> government is not the gatekeepers of what can or cannot be done in the digital society so with that we are technology neutral all right niho kami nag prefer ng ano but we have sabi ko nga what we're promoting, for example, if you have a new app, if you have a new technology that's quite privacy intrusive, we want, we, well, we introduce what we call privacy by design. You have to incorporate now how, um, incorporate data protection right at the get-go. How do you observe data subjects' rights? You know, Facebook, lahat ng nakapending sa kanila sa US Patent Office, the new apps that are coming out, are all privacy intrusive. Diba? So, may mga... <laughs> Yung po eh. So, I mean, it's, sabi nga na iba, it's getting more scarier and scarier. Mm -hmm. So sa atin, yes, you're worrying about local uh, regulation here, but we worry also about what's happening outside. Mm -hmm. And we can take advantage of that if we are prepared. Diba? At po kang hindi mag abate po yon. Ang trend po ngayon are more and more countries are tightening up. They're amending their laws. Hong Kong is now looking for imprisonment. <laughs> That defines lang sila eh. Nagmumove ho ngayon yung mga ibang countries to include that. When we came on board, they said, napaka-punitive ng Philippines. But ang trend ho ngayon, they're trying to amend it. Yung pong um, Thailand uh, came up with a law recently. I haven't read it. Somebody told me 
it's akin to ours. Let's take advantage. <laughs> right? So it's, what I mean is, yun po sinasabi. So from a privacy regulation perspective, we are not the, hindi ko kami magsasabi, wag yung gawin yung ano, gusto nyo kung mag-national ID, pwede ho yan eh. Basta right from the start, gawin ho natin yung, da, yung tama. We call it privacy by design. So other countries are recognizing that. Sabi nga nila, buti nga kayo, ngayon na nagsisimula, di gawin nyo na kailangan gawin dyan. Ngayon, we cannot even untangle our laws that created our national IDs. Yun yung kanilang law reform that they're doing. They're reforming it to make it stricter. Mm -hmm. Now we have the opportunity again to introduce, again, if technology comes in, then we can adapt. No, but privacy by design. Sandboxing is also an option. I've talked to companies. So I, I will not mention that. But a media company told me, sabi na, alam mo, meron kaming deal eh, na hindi namin ginawa. It's worth 100 million because we thought it's privacy, privacy intrusive. But I'm telling you, alam mo, kung ikaw ay kumpanya nagko-comply dun sa sinasabi namin, baka pwede natin pag-usapan na hindi na yung ma-miss yung opportunity for as long as the parameters, again, of compliance, accountability is there. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Vic, and then perhaps two more. Can I, anyone else aside from Vic? Okay. Um, this is uh, addressed to Ron, and then I think uh, hopefully the others could uh, uh, join in. My question, you were talking about evaluation of the impact uh, in your uh, comment. And I was wondering whether uh, when there are regulations or even existing re regulations that there could be a law that basically says um, after five years that that regulation was put in place, they have to be evaluated as to the impact and the cost of that regulation. Otherwise, if that's not satisfied or they, uh, they, they, they are not, uh, uh, they will be, sun uh, what do you call this, they will be discontinued. Uh, and you can start with a review over the next five years uh, to do that. Uh, that's my first uh, question. What do you think of that? And the second question is uh, uh, relates to the question of, uh, and this is to uh, uh, our uh, uh, doctor from FDA, but this is actually uh, also relevant to the question of um, in, uh, in other sectors like uh, the introduction of new technology like uh, biological-based uh, 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 technology, genetics, and, and GMOs, uh, etc., because there will be more of those this coming years. Uh, the, there are there are benefits, there are risks. So let me talk. Uh, let me give an example to concretize my question, which is the dimbaxia. Where is basically? The, it's the you you have to balance the the risk and and, and benefit, uh, and and the way that 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 whole episode was um, kind of uh, discussed in public, uh, I think there was really much to be desired to be to be improved. And actually, it's not clear what criterion you used in order to demonize it when there was very little risk when you compare, compared to the, uh, to the positive expected uh, numbers that could have been prevented. In other words, there could have been deaths, but even that may not have been proven, but the, the uh, effect on having, uh, of, of the, the missed opportunities to prevent more deaths was so much more. So what, what, what criterion or criteria do you use? Okay. So, okay, uh, one more, perhaps, question? Yes, please. After all, Vic had two questions. <laughs> uh, I am Bienvenido Plus. Uh, my question is for LTFRB and for the FDA. For LTFRB, um, about the, the, the cap on TNVS, I think it's 65,000 units in Metro Manila. I, I, why don't you just remove the cup uh, and allow many TNBs to come, maybe DD from China, live from America, and the uh, locals will expand. Because right now, we could limited, with limited number of TNBs, the waiting time is maybe about sometimes 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So if people will wait, it's just inconvenient. They might as well drive, and that creates traffic. No? So you, if you bring, bring down the waiting time from 20 minutes to say five or two minutes, then people will leave their car. 
So question number one. Que uh, question for FDA. I think that uh, it's very cumbersome for you to regulate micro, regulate, say, carinderia or, or say, um, I think that you, what would be good is to 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 uh, agro, uh, ag what this, uh, uh, aggregate them, no? So you say 100 calendar, yeah. Isa sa inyo maglokoloko dyan, sarado kay lahat. Instead of, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, inspecting everyone, no? You, know? you, should, you should police yourself, okay? Damay kay lahat. So therefore, they will be self-policing. Oh, wag kang magbenta ng expired food dahil madadamay kami. So I mean, they will be caring for each other. Because, uh, ilan, ilan ba kayo? Kasi I mean, pati... Pati perfume, i-regulate nyo ba? Pati, you know, mga suman at sago, i-regulate nyo ba? Di ba? O ino man na isa-isahin nyo. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, all right, so we just, we, we're, we'll throw the questions to Ron. Uh, uh, Vic's question first. Uh, then to uh, Engineer Matienzo uh, on the uh, biotech question also of Vic. I cannot agree more with my good friend Vic. In fact, other countries have created laws to create institutions for standardized impact evaluations, not just the programs, but also policies. So Mexico, for instance, has this. As you know, uh, we have been uh, sort of following this institutional innovation for a while. It's very critical in an environment such as regulation in general but in particularly of the fourth industrial revolution, because from every scholarly you know, uh, you know, writing that I've seen, uh, it will introduce shock upon shock on regulators uh, for a period of time in terms of uh, rollout of new technologies, new sectors affected. Uh, and so if you have in this set five regulators, soon we'll have 20, 30 regulators sort of affected by, in some way, this data revolution. So, so I do think that it's important in the sense that, uh, one, I, I think really there will be constant change management necessary on our regulatory agencies. And those 100 people that, uh, that our commissioner faced in LTFRB, uh, it's uh, for 500 people here, 200 people there, all of them uh, will we'll need to go through some kind of change management as the new technologies roll out. What will be your armament towards a reasoned and guided uh, change management? It will be evidence, mm -hmm. and therefore the evaluation. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you'll be very vulnerable. You'll be accused of siding with the new ones or siding with the old ones. If you are not armed with that evidence, they will just think that you are very subjective. So from a political economy point of view, academia, media, and other groups should be your allies in providing that evidence and that data. So leverage that as you are pushing your reform of your regulatory agency and pushing for new thinking on these, on these uh, uh, tech, new technologies. So I fully agree, an impact evaluation, at the very least, a cost-benefit analysis, I think, will be very useful. Okay. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, okay. well, um, if I may just add, um, um, estimating the cost implications of every regulation issue would be very, very challenging. So at the very start, you have to be sensitive if the regulations that you're issuing are fit for purpose or suited to the um, institutions that you supervise. If I may share the practice of the BSP, before we issue regulations, this goes through a consultative process. We have regular engagements with industry associations. As a matter of fact, we meet with uh, 14 industry associations um, in a year, um, varying frequency, just to get the flavor and their concerns on the policy that we intend to issue. After issuing the regulations, we again engage in um, active discussions on how uh, the challenges and implementation so that we could um, immediately amend if there's a need to amend. And, uh, especially if there are some pragmatic issues mm -hmm. in terms of implementing um, the, the regulations, particularly if you're trying to adopt international standards. Mm -hmm. There may be some international standards that are not suited to domestic situations. Mm -hmm. so. All right. And we'll go to yeah, 
FDA? Bigla akong kinabahan dun sa uh -huh. Dengvac siya. <laughs> Andito kasi si Senator eh. Pero approved na huba budget namin. <laughs> Yun yung scare namin nung ano eh, budgeteering. But anyway, I'll answer first the impact analysis ano, of the regulation. Actually, I think uh, all regulatory agencies are uh, required to do uh, regulatory impact analysis. Not, not quite. Not, not, yeah, yeah. Not it's, uh, it's just a new uh, directive, no? And we are, uh, the Food and Drug Administration is uh, partnering with the Development Academy of the Philippines. And uh, we have started uh, to train uh, people from the policy sector of uh, the FDA. Um, I think they attended up to advance, but we will be having our more in-depth uh, collaboration with DAP next year, uh, start February, and we will have our own. Uh, we cannot send all people to uh, DAP, so we will create our own. Mm -hmm. no? And uh, we have started, we have piloted one policy wherein we are doing uh, regulatory impact analysis before we will uh, submit it for approval. So. Uh, nandun ho tayo, dun ho tayo papunta, dun papunta ang FDA. Sa Deng Vaksha, I think, uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. I'm, I'm not a pharmacist, I'm an engineer. Um, there's a case ongoing, so it's quite a critical issue. But I agree with sir, no? Uh, papano ba namin yung ginawa? Uh, I think, sa FDA nga ba nanggaling yon Sa DOH, sa program? So there's an ongoing investigation right now. Um, pero ang laki talaga ng impact ho. It's not only Dengvac siya, but the whole immunization program of FDA, uh, of, of uh, Department of Health, no? The program. So yung kanina pinag-usapan natin, trust. Nawala yung trust ng tao, no? If, if you remember before, ang dami naming programs on immunization for, for April, October, may mga immunization programs kami. Grabe yung campaign. Di ba nag-ano pa tayo? I think polio, naging uh, polio-free Philippines pa tayo. Bigla yung nawala because of this Dengvaksha issue. So ngayon, unti-unti ho natin yan. Uh, I think our Secretary of Health is really very eager to uh, put back the trust of the people. Kasi ang daming ano ngayon, epidemics, di ba? Because hindi sila nagsasubject into immunization. So sir, uh, I think uh, ang ano namin dito is really to build up the trust because of that one issue on Dengvaksha. Huh? And, yung, and then yung question niya, yung tukol, question, sa, tukol sa pa, yung hindi lang karinderia, kundi sa sa, yung uh, gagawa ka ng community na all or nothing, no, kapag nag, may nagkamaling isa, lahat kayo punished. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the, the, the program on DTI, uh, our partnership program with DTI on micro entrepreneurs, um, sinisimulan lang ho yan. So, ang una ho natin ginawa is really to streamline the regulation for our locals. Kasi hindi ho natin dapat patayin ang local industry because of regulation. No? In as much as we would like to protect the health of the people, hindi dapat mamatay ang local industry. So, that's why we're open to partnership. Uh, hindi ho kami nandito to police everything, but to be a partner of each and every individual to protect the health of the people. No? So, umpisa pa lang ho yan, iro-roll out pa lang po natin yan. And ang nire-regulate ho ng uh, FDA in terms of food product are the pro processed packaged food product. Yun hong mga same day uh, na kinukonsume, that's uh, not within the jurisdiction pa rin ho, no? LGU pa rin yun. No? So, uh, punta ho tayo doon. We are open to suggestions, but uh, let's roll out this program first with um, DTI. No? Mm -hmm. So, sana ho, uh, ma-encourage din namin yung lahat ng ating mga local, ano, uh, medyo lenient kami. Kasi manufacturers sila eh. When we say manufacturing, kailangan may good manufacturing practice. Pero for these small uh, entrepreneurs, kailangan nga bang may GMP sila? or hikpitan lang natin sa sanidad. Kailangan nating kumita, but at the same time, protection na natin yung ating mga kapwa Pilipino. Okay. So, nandito ho ang uh, FDA will be partnering uh, with every, every entrepreneur po. Okay. So, Chairman Delga, siguro just the last point uh, of Sir Kanina about the 55, 
55,000 TNBs. Di ba pa din palaki? Unang-unang, una, I think, needs to be explained. San ba, na, san ba nang galing yung 55,000 na yan? Where, what, was the, what was the justification for, of LTFRB for even for considering that number? Where, where exactly did that number come from? Uh, two points were raised earlier on the general um, issue on competition. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely why there is a suggestion about inviting other companies. <clears throat> But the companies that she mentions are not actually the one that supplies the unit. I, uh, I would like to differentiate these two. The mention about the numbers on the 55, it's not actually 55, but 65. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a common supply base. And uh, it was not set arbitrarily, uh, if I may be allowed to, para lang may lagay natin yung timeline. <clears throat> yung sinasabing, um, we, I said earlier about uh, having to run after Uber and Grab for anti-colorum uh, activities. So <clears throat> the good part of that uh, was that we were able to engage them more transparently. No? Kasi nung una, may rapang kami, um, we talked to them, but they're a bit stingy on their data. No? I think both of them are trying to watch each other in that sense. And there's also a third player, yung UHAP. A small one. So you know, basically, the competition is between Grab and you, you hub. So, uh, so nung when we imposed the fine uh, on both Grab and Uber, and eventually Uber still continued accrediting uh, uh, additional uh, units, notwithstanding na meron lang kaming directive na hindi, kaya na napatawan sila ng suspension, and eventually they sought for reconsideration. We converted it into fine. Na? Now, <clears throat> moving forward, we created a technical working group meeting with the three accredited uh, TNVS at that, uh, TNCs at the time. I like to distinguish the TNC, the Transport Network Corporation, from the TNVS, the individual operators that supply the unit. So yung numbers po would pertain to the owners of the car. They are not the companies that run the system or the apps. I just want to distinguish that. No? So, <clears throat> so when we come up with that, we were able to understand yung um, yung uh, travel demand patterns, the volume of people that would ride on each day. So, <clears throat> uh, well, to cut a long story short, we came up with that 65. Is that 65,000 number uh, static, rigid? No. Uh, but at this point in time, we're still populating that number. So, ibig sabihin, we're still at this point in time where when we reach 65, we will revisit the number, and if we think that it's not enough, then we will open up. No? So as regards to inv inviting other TNCs for that matter, you know actually even before that we need to invite competition in order to raise the level of quality of the service. Kaya from the three, uh, we open it up. No? So at some point in time, uh, we're talking about uh, ngayon ata mga nine or ten na, na mga TNCs operating in the market. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, with that, we think that we would like to manage it still no, at this point in time. So we put a freeze on the acceptance of uh, new applicants for TNC. But again, I say, is it final, permanent? No. But at this point in time, uh, tama po yung sinasabi na there's a need to review from time to time these regulatory uh, uh, policies in place. Now, <clears throat> pagdating, um, so yun ang sinasabi ko na when we talk about having to run the whole service, especially in the case of the TNBS and the TNC, uh, we need to open up the market and so far as that one is concerned. But there's a much bigger picture as well. Hindi lang po yung servisyo, no? Meron po tayong tinitingnan, no? Anong klaseng servisyo na pwede natin ibigay sa kanila, no? I like to put that in perspective. <clears throat> yung service po ng TNBS is similar to taxi, okay? In fact, almost the same, except that they don't have a metro and their vehicles is fairly unmarked. Actually, meron sila supposed to be a sticker, uh, that's why, a uh, sticker that will identify as uh, TNBS. But other than that, hindi mo alam kung uh, private car ba yan or PUV ba yan. Kasi nga, yung mga TNBS are considered uh, public utility vehicles. Um, so... What are we talking about here? Ito yung mga mode of public uh, transport na walang rota. Na? As I've said earlier, you take a taxi or you take a TNBS, you go where you want to go. Ang gusto po nating mangyari, 
na anong klaseng serbisyo ang supposed to be tutugon dyan sa pangangailangan ng computer? I, if I have to say this, ang taxi. Kasi po yung taxi 24-7. Okay? 24-7. Yung TNBS po, yung konsepto ng TNBS is ride sharing. Ibig sabihin po, uh, pag may sasakyan ka, if you want to tie up with the TNCs, then you can take your car as a public utility vehicle at any time that you're free. Okay? But some of this, because they, uh, they're earning a bit more than the salary that they're taking now, are getting full-time. But what is the data that we have? The data is that there are more part-time than full-time TNVS driver operator, which just prove that the original concept remains the same. So, ibig sabihin yan, nagdadagdag tayo ng sasakyan on the road, and then again, you talk about traffic congestion, na mababa yung utilization ng isang unit compared to a taxi that's supposed to run 24-7, and it's there. So, anong kulang dun sa taxi? Yung apps. Nilagay na natin dun sa apps, uh, yung, yung apps sa taxi. So, it fairly levels up that service in so far as that one is concerned. O obviously, you might be thinking, ah, mayroong mga pasaway na taxi driver. That's another thing, no? That's uh, we have to address. Uh, that said, the bottom line here is about, we're not taking out the TNVS, but it's supposed to serve a complementary service to the taxi. Kasi yun nga, that is the principal mode eh. Nagiging popular yung TNVS because of the level of service. Uh, as you might have heard, we're putting up additional 5,000 taxi units on the road. But this time, and this is what I'm going to say, kasi may mga issues sa taxi eh. This time, it's going to be fleet managed on a fairly large operation. Kaya sinasabi natin dito na malalaki ang kukuha ng taxi service. The only way to run an effective, efficient, viable taxi service is when you run it on a fleet management system. Kung pa isa isa ka, problema talaga tayo. And when it's, uh, when it's poorly managed, yun ang nangyayari na mayroong mga pasaway na taxi driver, yung mga ganon. So that's precisely why we're pushing taxi, but we're not also eliminating uh, TNBS. So they can, they can uh, uh, be on the road uh, at the same time. Ano? So uh, you're talking about 65,000, just to give you the numbers. 65,000, ang, ang the one that we're targeting for TNBS. How many taxis there are in Metro Manila? 22,000 lang po in our database. So we need to also uh, increase the number of taxi uh, units on the road. Who will be on the road to get more passengers, uh, more than the ride-sharing concept that the TNBS offer? Um, on that score, sasabihin din natin, eh, anticipate ko na lang yung uh, mga sinasabi ng iba, eh, yung TNBS, meron din mga, new, uh, mga classification of service na mas mataas pa. Mga premium service, ano? Uh, mga SUV, uh, carpooling, and everything. We're actually in the works of putting up premium taxi. Na talagang that can also be at parallel and probably even better than uh, yung mga premium uh, service ng TNBS. <coughs> premium. Ibig sabihin po, yung, uh, yung engine displacement, mas mataas. Yung, yung uh, branding po, mas... Uh, uh, you probably talking about uh, yung mga talagang... It could be uh, SUV, no? So things like that that we're moving forward in having to upgrade uh, public transport system in this particular mode of service, which is uh, uh, the non-route service that we have. Okay, at this point, let me thank our, our discussants and, and presenters. Uh, this was a very lively and fruitful discussion. Uh, and now, uh, let me also now turn the floor and the ceiling to our Master of Ceremonies for the next part of the program. Thank you very much. I hope uh, everybody's still alive. <laughs> we now come to the concluding uh, part of our activity. Uh, let me introduce to you our closing speaker. 
He is a young senator of the Republic of the Philippines who has been serving the country for more than 17 years now. He was a multi-awarded mayor and a congressman of Valenzuela City. At the Senate, he chairs the committees on energy and economic affairs. His approach to running both uh, committees has been united by a common purpose, that is to empower consumers. Okay. He has championed several key legislative initiatives aimed at fostering greater competition within critical industries, boosting uh, efficiency and accessibility of public services, and lowering uh, electricity, electricity rates. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Senator Sherwin Gachalian. Good afternoon to everyone. <clears throat> First, let me greet um, our dignitaries for this afternoon. Um, let me greet Dr. Celia Reyes, uh, the president of PIDS. I had the uh, great opportunity of working with Dr. Celia when I was a mayor in Venezuela. And at that time, I, was, um, I had a big problem in Venezuela. I was asking Dr. Reyes, Dr. Reyes, how do I gather information about our constituents, especially uh, in terms of gauging poverty? You know? Because the census is only so often, and then the census is not given on a LGU or per LGU basis. And I had a big problem because I don't want to launch a program wherein we just do a shotgun approach at bahala na kung sino tatamaan. So we need a targeted program. At that time, um, Dr. Reyes and Valenzuela City launched the CBMS, the Community-Based um, Management um, System, wherein it is, it's a, you know, to make it uh, simple, it's a localized census that uh, we use local um, uh, employees of the government to gather information. And um, that was a uh, outstanding program because we created anti-poverty programs very targeted to our constituents, so we don't waste a lot of money. I also want to um, greet the star of the afternoon, Attorney Martin Delgra. <laughs> Seems to me na dami hong tanong kay Attorney Delgra kanina. Uh, also greet Mr. Ra Mr. Raimundo Liboro of the uh, National Privacy Commission. Of course, Dr. Sikat. I'm a big fan of your work, uh, Dr. Sikat. I've, read a lot of your uh, writings in different publications, and also Dr. Ronald Mendoza. Sir, good afternoon po. I have a um, few slides to show, but uh, before that, um, a part of me is also a politician, aside from being a senator, and being a politician, we should be able to explain complicated things in a very simple manner to Juan de la Cruz. At the end, when, we go, when I go home to Valenzuela and talk to our constituents, I must be able to explain what fourth industrial revolution means. No? Kasi pag sinabi kong Internet of Things, 3D printing, uh, um, artificial intelligence, siguradong talo na ako next election. No? So I have to explain it in, a, in very simple terms. And my explanation about fourth industrial revolution is really making our lives more convenient, at the same time, making our world a better place to live in using technology. In very simple terms, uh, that's my explanation to Juan de la Cruz. And over the past two years, I've been assigned as the chairman of the Energy Committee. And definitely, when you talk about energy, it's part of that objective of making the world a better place to live in, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, using technology to clean our environment. And I just want to share with you a few um, technologies which I think will disrupt the energy sector and the power industry, not only here in the Philippines, but the whole world. My simple na tanong po ako sa inyo dito sa picture. Um, do you see a power plant in that picture? Kito nyo ba isang power plant in that picture? I'm sure your answer is no. No, wala kayong nakikitang 
you know, big massive uh, turbines or big massive uh, coal plants. Our uh, image of a power plant is this big massive machines generating energy. But in the future, the power plants will be coming from our homes. You know? And one of the most important real estate in the future is not the real estate that you buy in your villages, but the real estate on top of your heads, the roofs. Because that real estate will, can now generate power to sell into the grid or to sell to your neighbor. Um, I remember going to, I was invited to um, Germany to look at the different energy technologies there. And one of the things that, that really struck me is what they call the peer-to-peer -peer electricity trading. Uh, what happens now is since you can generate power through solar in your rooftop, you can actually sell that to your neighbor or sell that to your community. So everyone now becomes a power plant. Everyone now can generate power and can sell it to their neighbor. With the advent of blockchain, with the advent of um, faster internet, this is now a reality. But the question is, ready na ba tayo dyan? Do we have the policies that will enable this technology? Do we have the regulation that will regulate technology? Or do we really need to regulate this technology? This, because this is part of the democratization of electricity in the whole world. But definitely, the peer-to-peer -peer electricity trading is part of what they call the distributed energy resource. Now, power systems now are not centralized, but distributed to different um, uh, areas, even to your homes. And uh, right now, if you talk about distributed energy resources, the ERC has no regulation. Even the Department of Energy has no uh, department circular or any material for that matter that will promote or even regulate this type of technology. This technology is already happening. No? It might happen here after so many years. Definitely it will not happen tomorrow, but definitely the world is going to that direction. Second is the if you talk about you know, making uh, the world a better place, we have to remove combustion engine on the road. You know, because almost 40% of carbon emissions come from combustion engines. The ordinary combustion engines, you know, the jeeps, the, the, the buses, the trucks, especially diesel when you use diesel. And if you want to clean uh, our air, definitely we have to move into the electric vehicle space. And more so, um, uh, more than the objective of um, cleaning our air, the electric vehicle also becomes a moving power plant. You know, because it has batteries, you can store power there. And just imagine this vehicle can now power villages, can now power homes, can now power offices. Again, I remember going to Germany and they're, they're starting to build these smart buildings. We're in the smart buildings can be powered by cars, and then those cars moving to a different location can also power that specific uh, establishment. So cars now becomes a moving power plant. But then again, uh, if you look at um, regulation here in the Philippines, uh, we don't have a specific regulation that will regulate electric vehicles, more so the rollout of charging stations here in our country. Um, I'm trying to promote this technology here in our country. And you cannot promote electric vehicles without the charging stations. No, you cannot you know, buy an electric vehicle and, and charge it with your phone charger. It's impossible. So you have to work on the entire ecosystem. But then again, how do you regulate the charging station? Because it acts like a utility. Paano if, he, if that charging station will control a specific area, who will regulate that charging station? So there's no specific regulation yet on that charging station. In fact, I was in the last two days, I was also looking at the regulation of LTFRB. Because I was researching, paano kung tomorrow I'll import a Tesla that can run as fast as 200 kilometers per hour. And apparently, in the uh, LTO regulation, uh, um, electric vehicles will fall under what they call the low-speed vehicle category in which you cannot, 
in which the restricted speed is only up to 40 kilometers per hour. At limited ka lang sa loob ng mga central business district. So obviously, the LTO can register your electric vehicle, your Tesla, but it has limitation because it doesn't have the right regulation for this type of vehicles. Another technology actually are batteries. No? And as we all know, batteries is becoming a very important component when you talk about clean energy. And uh, China is going in in a massive way to produce commercial scale batteries. And when China goes in in a massive way, well, rest assured, no, prices will drop, because, will drop because it will commoditize the entire technology. And that's good for consumers like um, consuming countries like the Philippines and ASEAN. But um, this picture is actually quite interesting because four years ago, we had this technology already. No? And this technology was built by a company called AES. It's a big energy company in the US. They came here. They said the Philippines is one of the most, um, uh, has the most robust laws in terms of renewable energy. And if you talk about renewable energy, you will need batteries. So four years ago, they came here to build a 10 megawatt uh, power plant that will stabilize the grid. You know? Because importante ho, it's very important to have uh, grid stability when you talk about solar, you talk about wind. Pero sa awa po ng Diyos, after four years, this battery is still not functioning. And they came to, the, to my office and, and uh, requested for assistance because Sabi you know, it's been four years and we put up this plant, we invested this much, ever, uh, this much money, but we have not pumped a single kilowatt into the grid. And I asked them, bakit? What happened? You know? Because apparently, our grid operator has no clue on how to use this type of technology, more so the regulator has no clue how to regulate this type of technology. And it's such a shame because this type of technology now, we can be the first no, in Southeast Asia to use batteries to stabilize the grid. But because of lack of knowledge, lack of regulation, and the absence of initiative, this battery remains to be a display in Masinlok, Zambales. No? And sayang po, no, it's, 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 it's such a shame. But even though we're moving into a very sophisticated uh, uh, power systems by using re renewable energy, we still have about 2.7 million households without power and without electricity. And because of the 7,000 islands that uh, we have, uh, it's quite expensive to put cables and transmission lines to all 7,000 islands. So the objective here is to use new, new technology distributed technology to power those homes. And I don't know if you have been uh, uh, updated with what's happening in the power industry, but there's this company called Solar Para Sabayan that is now disrupting the entire power industry. This company, um, their goal is to put up mini grids and microgrids in all the areas which, has, which doesn't have electricity underserved and underserved, underserved and unserved areas, and they will charge one-third of the cost of the prevailing price. Sounds good, but when they launched this idea, it created a lot of noise, in fact, a lot of hate among the utilities. Because sabi ng utilities, pag pumasok ito, mababawasan kami ng areas. Because the utilities earn from the areas and from the households that they connect, even though those households only get one hour of electricity a day. But then again, um, this company is also encountering a lot of problems because the concept of distributed energy systems, such as microgrid and mini grids, are still quite alien here in our country. In fact, there is no policy that will promote this type of technology and there's no regulation. In fact, ERC is still in the process of drafting a, what they call a distributed energy resource regulation to regulate this type of energy. This type of technology is important because you have to manage 
the traditional utility as well as this type of disruptive technology para wala pong away on the ground. And lastly, and this is quite a quite an interesting technology. Wala home picture because it's still in the uh, research phase. Uh, there's now a lot of talk about going nuclear here in our country. And when you talk about, again, clean energy, there's this small um, group that says, we need to go into nuclear energy because it's more stable and it's clean. But when you talk about nuclear energy now, then there's this risk and safety concerns. It's, is it safe? Is it affordable? Where do you, uh, where do you um, throw the nuclear waste after? Or where do you keep the nuclear waste after? There's this company in the United States, it's called TerraPower. It's co-founded co by Bill Gates. And this technology is one of, I think, one of the most disrupted technology in the nuclear space and later on in the power industry. Because this technology, what they aim to do it's a simple technology using simple reactors, smaller reactors, as small as 50 megawatts of power. Ngayon kasi if you build the traditional power plant, it's, uh, the minimum is about 600 megawatts. But here, you can, they can build as small as 60 megawatts. And the clincher here is they can reuse spent fuel and depleted uranium. So in effect, the waste being generated by other traditional nuclear power plants can be fed into this system and use it again for power. It sounds too good to be true, but I've been doing a lot of research. And hopefully, they will launch their first commercial plant by 2020. But the question here is, are we ready for this type of technology here in the Philippines? You know, one of the proudest things that I always tell um, our friends here in ASEAN that the Philippines is, I think, one or the second country that deregulated the power industry. And we're actually one of the few ASEAN countries which has a very robust renewable energy law. And when you talk about renewable energy, one way or another, you have to talk about nuclear power. And if you talk about this type of technology, are we ready to regulate this type of technology? We were once ready. We had the Bataan nuclear power plant 40 years ago. But uh, the regulators were dissolved. You know, the agencies that were tasked to promote that technology were dissolved. And now we don't have any entity that will promote or even study. I think the most prudent thing to do is study first whether this type of technology from Terra Power can be adopted here in the Philippines. So the challenge, actually, if you ask me, Alam niyo ho, uling huli na ho tayo. If you ask me uh, from the government standpoint, including myself, um, huling huli na ho tayo in terms of responding to the fourth industrial revolution. Responding to disruptive technologies in power, in transportation, in many things. And this is actually one of our bad habits here in our country, especially government. We respond pag nandyan na ho yung problema. We respond Pag nandyan na yung technology. I think a better habit should be we respond even the technology will come 10 years after. We respond even though the problems will 10, year after, 10 years after. I think solutions and regulations and policies should be formed now, even in the absence of that technology. And I think it's very important to recognize and also to realize that the whole world is moving into this type of technology, moving into this fourth industrial revolution. And we cannot come up with laws and regulation pag nandyan na ho itong mga technology. Because what's happening right now is government and the lack of regulation and the lack of policy is becoming the barrier to this type of technology coming to our country. Government should be an enabler, not a barrier. But because we don't have you know, the proper regulation and policies in place. You know, simple things such as e-vehicles, electric vehicles. Since we don't have policy and regulation for electric vehicles, if you bring in your electric vehicle tomorrow, you cannot register it with the government. You know? And government now becomes a barrier to entry. 
Um, this is such an important event because I think the first step is to realize all of these problems, to realize all of these gaps, and to realize that this type of technology is already a reality. You know, a lot of this technology probably is quite um, alien to most of us, but because of this type of event, now we realize that we need to move faster and we need to respond faster. So once again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much to, to, to PIDS for inviting me. Rami salamat po. Thank you so much, Senator Gachalian, for sharing your initiatives and your time with us. But before we let you go, may I request all the speakers to please join the good secretary and uh, rather the good senator and um, Dr. Celia Reyes on stage for a photo opportunity. Yes, yes, Bob. yes. Also, um, so that concludes our, um, our activity today and we hope to see you in our future events. But uh, may, may, we would like to, to uh, remind you to please fill out the, the evaluation sheet and submit it to the secretary. Thank you so 